So don't just be too strong. Everybody is now. You members of our various cities, our bad past presidents. You can't start like that. We recognize no member here present as it has been advertised. They pay for our seminar on land vision. But before we start, I'd like to let us start with opening prayer. And this opening prayer will be said with the use of so this opening prayer will be said by adopting our second of national anthem. You see, no, she doesn't need to. She, oh, she, she, she just need to flow with it. Select, um, and those are the things you need to learn. You understand? Like you've been doing it, you understand? But that's exactly what. So just take it again. Don't use my word. Use yours. So one, two, Good morning, our esteemed members. We welcome you to the Sunday and this is our seminar here today, we like to set on 2020. Good morning. You will do it, you will see it, but just take it and don't copy. Do your own. You have to get this to go out and provide this to you. You know, one practice is one. Professional. Now, you can use the special or she can use the because oh my, you go from mistake. I will like that. I don't know. Who knows? Sorry, I'm not. 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 i am not 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 i am not
Good morning, professional colleagues, as you join us. Some people are asking about the audio. Uh, at the moment, all of us are on mute, so it's not a mistake. Welcome, and uh, we hope to start soon.
الو Hello. Good morning. Yeah, morning, sir. Good morning. Yes, sir. Okay, we we are about to start the program now. In the, in the next three minutes, in the next two to three minutes, we should start, sir. Oh, 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 oh. It's uh, at least people will now know that the system is working.
Good morning, Hearts team members. We welcome you to the Off that one, off that one, off that one. Good morning, our esteemed members. We welcome you to the Chacha Digital Transition of Nigeria. Good morning, our esteemed members. Welcome you to the Chatham Institute of Transition of Nigeria, July 22nd, 2020. We would like to start today's program with the National Hunting. The opening prayer for today will be the second stanza of the national hunting. O oh God of creation, direct our noble course, guide our leaders right, help our youth the truth to know, in love and honesty to grow, and living just and true. Great love to height has been, to build a nation where peace and justice shall be. The CIT and Hansen.
Without further ado, permit me to introduce dignitaries here present. I'd like to introduce the 14th president of our great institute, our mommy, Dame Gladys Olajim Orkestin, please, FCT High. I'd also like to introduce the vice president of our great institute, Mr. Adedayo Isaac Adeshino. I'd also like to introduce the chairman of the education committee, also a council member, Professor Godwin Oyedoku. Also present here is the registrar of our great institute, Mr. Adekusayo Haubade. Right now, I would like to hand over the mic to the, to the moderator who will be taking us through today's seminar. In the person of Professor Godwin Hoye, to the program of today. You are welcome, sir. Good morning, distinguished members of our Dare Institute. Welcome on board. Uh, we have our president here present in the person of the Olaji Mokesi to the FCTI. And again, I'd like to recognize the presence of our vice president, Mr. Adishina Adidaya. We have our registrar, as she has said the other time, Mr. Adishina of Kawu Bade. We have one of our erudite uh, scholars and members here in the Institute, person of uh, Elder Ivani. Today, we are witnessing another uh, development in our Institute in such a manner where we are responsive and not necessarily in kind of the reactionary matter. During the last few weeks, matters of stamp duties have gained attention of everybody within the system. There have been a lot of misconception. There have been issues about misinformation. As one of the tenets of the institutes, we are bound to educate our members and general public on matters that has to do with transition. We are not ignorant of the part that is our responsibility. It is on this that the Council of our dear institute, as ably led by President in Malawi Market Simply, FCTI, approved within a short period of time that this program should come up. It enjoyed the approval of the and we here we have today. I will not attempt to deliver any paper, rather to allow our members that have been identified to be up and in in this year to come and speak to us on matters that we have nine today. If I come to rest, just to welcome you, I will still come back as a moderator.
as a result of our belief that people will act when they understand. People will behave as they understand. So when this issue of stamp duties came up, a lot of questions were asked, some of which I didn't even have answers to. Um, as an institute, we made a submission to join tax board about what we feel about the stamp duty act, what we think should be removed, what we think should be added. And so we, we believe that this is part of what we've been covering up for as an institute, that we should move away from direct to indirect taxes. And this is what we are doing. And for Nigerians to key in into it properly and voluntarily to understand how it works, for them to know that if their documents are not stamp duty, they cannot submit it as evidence in court. These are the part of the things that we want to talk about today. We are doing this because we believe that we must educate Nigerians. We must mobilize Nigerians to believe in paying taxes. And in doing that, we want to make sure that we reduce to the barest minimum, the gap, the trust gap between the government and Nigerians. As we are all aware, the implementation of the provisions of this legislation has commenced in earnest. However, it has been observed that there are still a lot of misconceptions about certain provisions of the Act and its administration. It is in response to this situation that FRS just released a public notice clarifying issues in the administration of Stamp Duties Act for the benefit of taxpayers and the general public. And we want to appreciate the staff, the, 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 the chairman of FRS and the staff of FRS for their proactive measures that they are taking in educating Nigerians about the Stamp Duty Act. It is important to emphasize here that our interest is to have the Stamp Duties Act that is meeting its purpose as a veritable revenue source for government while also ensuring that taxpayers are not worse off. So what is our commitment to this cause? We have, like I said, already produced a position paper proposing amendments to certain provisions of the Stamp Duties Act to be accommodated in the Finance Bill 2020. As the Institute has pointedly advocated, tax laws should be reviewed continually in line with current realities and global best practices. This seminar is meant to be an interactive session and as such, we will provide ample time for attendees to bear their minds. We have lined up everyday professionals to direct the various aspects of the Stamp Duties Act, while Professor Godwin Oyedoku will be anchoring the program. We have our members who are going to enlighten us. I've always said that even as a tax professional, we don't know it all, so we can specialize. It's an area where we can also specialize in. We can specialize in indirect transition, and even in indirect transition, we can specialize in an area. This is one of the areas where we can specialize. And we have where our very own Dr. Abani, who is a guru in this area to lead us. We have other members who we believe in who are who know 
the nitty gritty of the stamp duties act. So please be free to ask questions. That is why we are here. But for us to know what it means, what does stamp duty mean? What, who, what are we paying it for? Who, what uh, items do we pay stamp duties on? How do we pay? Who do we pay to? These are the questions that we need to ask if we are not so clear about it. And the answers will be given to us. As a concluding remark, may I offer my profound appreciation to the chairman and members of the Education Committee of Council, our distinguished facilitators and staff of the Institute for our contributions in making this webinar possible. I also thank our valued participants for your presence. Please let it be uh, proactive, let it be interactive. Let us bear our mind. It is when we know the problems that we can find solutions. And as an institute, after this uh, meeting, we will bring together all issues that we believe we need to translate to the powers that be. So that even as we prepare for the 2020 Finance Act, we will look at all these ones and see which one, even as the Stamp Duties Act is on ground, which ones can we export? What can we bring in? How can we make it a better act for everybody to operate? Ladies and gentlemen, on this note, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my esteemed pleasure and honor to declare this webinar open as I look forward to an educative and interactive session. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to enjoy all of us to participate, to make it very, very interesting. This is why we are here. And we are here for you anytime. We will continue to increase the timing if the need arises. So please don't be in a hurry. Let us devote today to acquire knowledge on some duties. Are. Thank you very much. Thank you, our president. Without further delay, we will move straight to the business of the day, which is the education part of it. We have Dr. Mark Abani, one of our revered members, and is going to take us up on the some duties in Nigeria, a comparative analysis of principal arts, and if we look at it vis a vis the amendment bill that was um, put forward sometime before, or what we should know about that. Dr. Mark Abani, please unmute you. yourself. I trust your judgment on this. And we hope you will be able to do justice to that within the next 35 minutes. I can Thank understand. You. And I'm not in the fact that you have a lot to give to us. And I've also gotten the approval of the president that the slides that you are, you are giving us will be shared with all our members. We want you to work under the anointing of our time. Let our time lead your spirit. I hope you understand me, sir. Thank you, sir, as you have the uh, floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, our president. Uh, good morning, all council members. Good morning, the moderator. Good morning, all um, professional colleagues and guests. Um, if I may stand on existing protocols uh, in view of time, uh, we are going to discuss a number of things. Now, today has quite a few things on it. It's both the analysis with the Principal Act and the Amendment Law, uh, and also um, other colleagues are going to be speaking on implementation and its effects on the stakeholders 
and finally on the administration. So there's quite a lot. So um, mine is limited to a comparative analysis of the principal act and the amendment law, which is actually before us because there, there, there um, has been passed. So what we're going to cover today is uh, some basic background. Uh, I always call this teaching grandmothers to suck eggs. But uh, it's surprising how many um, grandmothers may argue over whether it's a chicken egg or a duck egg or an ostrich egg. So we're going to go through the basics of uh, stamp duties, the types of duties, uh, the stamp laws as they exist, not as we wish them to be, the current structure of the principal stamps is, uh, stamp duties act, and some of the issues that it has. And it's only some of them because, uh, as uh, Dame Simplis has uh, outlined, the Institute has actually put forward uh, quite a number of proposals for the uh, forthcoming uh, bill. But I'm not discussing those particular uh, detail, uh, details of that until uh, the appropriate time. Uh, I will be discussing the Stamp Duty Amendment Act of, the, uh, of 2019 and some of the specifics of what it has addressed. Um, I will outline a few, an example of a few explanations that are still unclear um, and a practical question uh, where we need to talk through. Uh, at this point, I must uh, echo uh, our president's um, commendation to FIRS as they have been trying to pull together uh, a lot of um, advice, a lot of guidance on this. Uh, and as with everything, the more you probe into it, the more you discover that you still need to know even more, and there's always variations. So just some of the basics. What is stamp duty? It's actually um, a stamp or, uh, uh, that is affixed to a document, uh, and these are required legally for certain types of transactions. Historically, they started in the 17th century um, in Europe, and it was one way that authorities were trying to tax merchants and various other businesses. And by dealing with their receipts, they were able to actually make sure that uh, they collected revenue. Uh, so it covers a variety of documents, uh, notary acts, agreements, conveyancing of land. And in the UK, stamp duty is almost all but reduced to issues around uh, property, uh, transfer of uh, shares, and um, uh, 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 land itself. It also uh, has to do with powers of attorney, uh, contract notes, valuations, capital uh, uh, for companies, uh, bank notes, promissory notes, mortgage notes, and so on and so forth. Um, our laws were introduced formally in uh, 19... Um, 39 and I'll, I'll discuss that one in a little bit but they are very much out of date uh, there are so many parts of the principal act that were not addressed in the finance act for instance um and we'll come to that uh, is it is are we going to pay 50 naira stamp on a four naira uh, transaction so but why are we uh, involved with stamp duty well, as I said before, stamp governments have imposed these in order to raise money. It's notable that in England in 1694, this was actually introduced to fund a war. Traditionally, um, for most taxes, uh, and certainly for taxes that have their sources in, in the Western world, a lot of them were raised in order to fund wars. Methods of collection have often been around the same issues of funding wars. Hopefully with peace, we won't have uh, so many issues around that. One thing many people don't understand is that pay as you earn was a method of collecting money uh, to fund the post-war recovery in, in, in Europe. In Nigeria, they are a significant source of government income. Uh, and uh, I have a few references down uh, below there, which when you get this, you'll be able to see. Uh, but 127 billion Naira was raised in the five-year period 2015 to 2020. But very, very significantly, 67 billion is being raised in January to July of this year. Uh, so it has shown that once you start concentrating on it, it becomes a veritable source of income for, for the country. We are also moving from 
direct taxation to indirect taxation. So we need to bear that in mind when we're putting forward uh, and modifying some of these laws that at the same time, direct taxation should therefore go down to compensate for the additional income being taken out of indirect taxation. Otherwise, um, the impact can be very significant on business. So what, what are the very basics? There are two types of duties. Fixed duties, doesn't matter how much money is involved in the underlying instrument, um, it's a fixed amount. And there's a list of examples of figures that, uh, uh, of instruments that go uh, uh, attract a fixed duty. And many people and much of the public is all uh, interested around the 50 Naira fixed duty in relation to um, receipts and, and bank uh, transactions. And then you have ad valorem duties. These ones vary depending upon the amount of consideration, how much money was involved. Uh, and so there are various scales. There are deeds of assignment, deeds of release, tenancy and lease agreements, mortgage, and so on. One that has attracted, again, the attention of everybody is tenancy and lease agreements and the potential for up to 66% 6 uh, of the lease agreement to be charged uh, by way of stamp duty. Uh, it's been said several times, none of these are really new, but what is new is the fact that uh, we have dusted off these uh, various uh, duties and have actively started to collect them. Uh, it's in the process of collecting them that uh, I know that both the Institute's uh, uh, proposals and comments for the 2020 uh, bill and uh, uh, comments on, on wider issues will concentrate as we try to make sure we have that balance between uh, direct and indirect taxes, especially with regard to ad valorem uh, duties. Um, for example, uh, a lease agreement, if you have up to 6% uh, stamp duties on it, um, you will also have another 7.5% VAT possibly on that lease. Um, there will have been a withholding of between 5 and 10% withholding tax, which true is advanced tax for the corporate income tax or personal income tax of the lessor. But these need to be explained in far more detail so that people understand what is happening. Otherwise, the knee-jerk reaction is that there's double taxation when there isn't double taxation or where it may impact in the way in which business is done. So what are the laws we're talking about? This is the Principal Act, which is the Stamp Duties Act uh, S8 of uh, 2004. Its origins came, go back to when the British came in the 1890s. As I said, um, they continue to use it as a fairly easy and direct way of extracting uh, taxes based on certain transactions that were necessary to do. Um, our first version was passed by the UK Parliament in 1939, uh, and there have been various um, variations of it, uh, resolutions and uh, changes, but really nothing substantial between 1955 and the Finance Act of 2019. Now, this is significant because it has now come onto the front step. So the work that the CITN is doing with regard to putting forward points for the um, Finance Bill 2020, which will become the Finance Act uh, 2020, uh, will be important because they are quite widespread in, in what they are trying to address some of the fundamental uh, flaws. Uh, it's charged by the federal government on stampable transactions and state governments uh, for companies uh, and you just need a company at one end of the transaction and it becomes stamp, it becomes collectible by the Federal Inland Revenue Service, as we'll see from the law, uh, law amendments. Uh, and state governments are responsible for stampable transactions between individuals from uh, uh, Mark Abani to Professor. Uh, for example, if we have a lease agreement in us in our two names, then the stamp on that should go to the state, probably where that property is, uh, is, is registered. The amendment, the Finance Act 2019, uh, was focused and it sought to increase, and this rubric is directly from the Act, it's to increase revenue generation uh, from stamp duties, especially on electronic stamps. So the whole purpose of the Finance Act 20, uh, 2019 amendment 
was to get more money. But of course, it hasn't addressed some of the underlying issues. And so there's a myriad of issues with the, um, with the principal act. Uh, the principal act is structured. Um, you have a, a, the citation in the first section and um, interpretation section, section two, uh, and then is divided into three principal parts. Generally, part one applies to instruments from setting of the charges through the administrative structures and some of the penalties. Part two deals with the regulations applicable to particular instruments from agreements, bank notes, bills of exchange, promissory notes, conveyances, leases, and so on, uh, right through to receipts and share warrants. And uh, that's all dealt with there. Part three provides for supplemental issues such as duty on the capital of companies, definitions of loans, and certain miscellaneous items. And the schedule behind all of this cross links to parts one, parts two, and parts three as required and provides detail of amounts of uh, uh, exactly the instruments and so on and so forth. So the schedule is quite important. Now, the difficulty with all of this is that it's quite dense. It's, it's archaic language. Um, most uh, uh, taxes are moving towards being simplified where everybody can understand them. And certainly the schedule could benefit from a lot more unpacking and um, clarification so that people are able to find their way around this particular uh, uh, section at this particular and very important schedule, which defines how much people are collecting, what you're collecting and so on and so forth. So there are lots of issues with that uh, principal stamp uh, uh, duty act, the poor structure of the act, uh, with respect to the charges, duties, and exemptions, um, it doesn't really flow properly. It has, a, a, you have to cross-reference places that are not logical in doing that. Um, it has some difficulty in the charging concepts, in uh, exactly why we're charging, what we're charging, and who we're charging. In theory, if you spent enough time bent over it, you might get some clarity there, but it needs to become far more modern in, in defining these ones. The language, the terminology, and a lot of it is outdated. Um, uh, uh, the the re rates referred to, uh, and I go back to, for instance, these uh, four Naira, any amount above four Naira has to be receipted with a stamp to receipt. These things are so archaic that they don't really help uh, us at all. Now, both the previous uh, uh, feedbacks in uh, earlier and the latest feedback have recommendations around the scope of the act, around the structure, including definitions, trying to clarify some of these issues. Uh, we have proposals around the rates and proposals around the way in which the administration is run. Um, that will be explored much further once the uh, call for Finance Bill 2020 starts uh, going through uh, wider discussions. At the moment, it has been fed through to the Joint Tax Board and other relevant stakeholders in the Federal Ministry of Finance. So I'm not going to go into any detail on those particular issues. So to the Finance Act amendments itself, as I said at the beginning, it was focused. It sought to increase revenue generation from duties on electronic stamps and transactions. It wasn't in any way, manner or form, aiming to address fundamental uh, lacuna or bring the principal law up to date. Um, and there were uh, five sections within the Finance Act that made amendments to the, finance, to the uh, principal act. Section 52 amended section two, and what it was doing was replacing the interpretation of stamp, stamped and instrument, more or less with the same words, but uh, to also uh, include electronic, uh, digital and electronic stamps. So what we do, did was to start to set the groundwork for the modern world we live in, where a lot of transactions are done electronically 
uh, and where there is, it would be otherwise difficult to even find something that you could stick a stamp on. Um, the next section, section two, uh, uh, sorry, section 53 amended section four of the principal act. And so what it did was um, provide a certain amount of clarity and remove NIPOs completely from the window. So the federal government has been replaced with Federal Inland Revenue Service and uh, the state government with the relevant state authority. Uh, section 54 amended section 89 by repeal and replacement. And I'll go through each of these very briefly. Uh, section 55 repeal section 90, which provided that certain forms of receipts were not taxable, especially by banks. So this allows section the expansion of section 89 to come fully into place. And uh, section 56 amended the schedule, which as I've said at the beginning has fundamental problems. Uh, and it only amended it with respect to really uh, security exchange commission documents. So there's a lot more that needs to be done in this area. So if we look at the specifics, it's replaced and expanded the interpretation of stamps, stamped and instrument. So you now have it to include an electronic stamp or an electronic acknowledgement by denoting any duty or fee. So apart from ex uh, uh, in expanding all of those three um, interpretations, because section two is the interpretation section, it's made it abundantly clear that electronic stamps and electronic uh, uh, transactions will be subject to tax. Now that in itself has certain questions about what we mean by electronic uh, uh, documents and so on, which we, we, we will look at. Section 53, uh, apart from putting out of that one is not really controversial. There's no real issue around it. Um, section 54 amended section 89 of the principal act. Basically section 89 was initially just two um, subsections but now it's been expanded to four, of which there are three primary, um, primary sectors. Um, so it's expanded the definition of receipts to include both the use of uh, an adhesive stamp or a digital stamp for payments of stamp duties. So if you are issuing a receipt, not only can you use an adhesive stamp, which are now being produced by FIRS, and I understand that many states will be producing their own in respect of individual transactions. Uh, I think Chief Ubani will talk more about that. Um, it also provides for, um, a, a platform and FRS has provided a platform to provide uh, online electronic assessments uh, and stamping for uh, electronic documents um, where you, you don't really have a physical item that you can go and adhere a physical stamp to. It also has regularized the CBN announcement of 2016, where it has taken the figure and said, uh, the 15 Naira one-off um, stamp duty is in respect of transfers of 10,000 pounds, 10,000 Naira or more. We wish it was 10,000 pounds, a lot, a lot less would come in. 10,000 Naira or more. Um, and it also uh, does not apply if we're moving money uh, between uh, accounts. Um, so it's effectively addressed the lacuna there, but has not addressed the lacuna, I keep on going back to, of the other de minimis limits in the Principal Act are still there and still need to be addressed and brought up to date. And, and finally, it provides that any duty paid in relation to the above will be uh, applied as a credit against any of the duty that should be paid. Um, so and this gives rise to a couple of questions, one of which I pose uh, towards the end of, uh, of this presentation. As I said, section 55 repeals section 90, uh, effectively allowing section 89 and uh, expanded uh, application to the banks uh, to, to run without uh, interruption. And section 56, um, as ex essentially exempting share transfers and payments made in pursuance to a regulated security uh, lending transaction, which is governed by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. And the purpose behind this is to try and drive more investment into 
um, Securities and Exchange Commission uh, uh, documents and the investments and so on and so forth in order to drive that sector of our capital markets. So specifically, it added a category of exempt receipts in relation to uh, exemption of receipts in relation to SEC um, transactions. And it also made uh, exemptions specifically for shares when they were transferred to an approved borrower, all within the context of the Securities and Exchange Commission, where shares were returned to an approved agent, again, within the Securities and Exchange Commission rules and all documents that are related to lending and transactions within the Securities and Exchange Commission. So this is an extremely focused piece of legislation that should drive greater activity on the stock exchange and through the Securities and Exchange Commission. So this is an example where a, a tax is being used by removing it from the, the list of taxes in order to drive investment in that particular sector. But there are still explanations that are unclear. And uh, as I said at the beginning, FIRS has sent out some guidance, uh, their information circular on, in May, um, which has got quite a lot of good explanations inside it. And so I don't intend to go back and run over any of them. Uh, and, but I just wanted to draw uh, attention to paragraph three, which explains instruments and receipts that are liable to stamp duties. And it says, and, and, and these are quotes from it, that instruments and receipts which must be stamped include the following. All written or printed dutable uh, instruments or receipts, and you will find these in the schedule. Um, all electronic dutable instruments For these transactions and for electronic documents, it's particularly it needs much further unpacking for us to be completely clear about exactly what it applies to and what it deals with. Um, it also goes on to say all printed documents, including POS receipts and fiscalized uh, uh, device uh, receipts, ATM printouts, and other forms of written or printed acknowledgement. So it's extremely wide. And there's still going to be some questions. Uh, and I take one of the FIRS examples next and ask a few questions. I don't have the immediate answers, but it's something for us to discuss. How far reaching is this? And how practical is the proposal that we should all report ourselves as these things happen to FIRS? Or uh, and for many of these things, they will be for FIRS. They will not be for um, individuals and, at state level. But the question still arises as to whether some of these uh, are, are state issues. And I know that Chief Obani, who will be following me, is going to speak extensively about the impact with um, state revenues and how that those should be run. Uh, and he finally says all electronically generated receipts and any form of electronic acknowledgement of money suitable transactions. So this would presume that uh, stamp duty would now be automatically added by say Netflix when they were sending you a receipt uh, for your payment. So these need, the practical implications of these need to be worked out. And so that brings me to almost my last slide. So uh, Prof, you will be pleased to know I haven't uh, used up the full time in order to allow us uh, uh, get more people in. I've taken an example from the FIRS guidance of May 2020, but I've modified it so that the payment to APZ was by bank transfer at an ATM. 
their example says it was a cash payment. If it's a cash payment, then you get your receipt there and then, and if it's to be stamped, it's to be stamped. It's too simplistic an example. What is far more likely to happen is that um, uh, XYZ uh, will go and transfer money uh, using uh, an automated teller machine. Um, so in this case and in this example, ABZ's Limited's Chief Accounting Officer, after receiving, I've changed it to a bank transfer of 500,000 from Mr. XYZ, uh, on behalf of uh, his company, composes a message that reads, receipt of 500,000 hereby acknowledged. We are all guilty of, we all do this. Uh, I've just transferred money to you. Can you confirm you have received it? Is that amount to a receipt for the purposes of uh, stamp duty? And he sent the same via WhatsApp Messenger. So in this case, it's a visage that the WhatsApp message acknowledging the receipt of 500,000 is a receipt for which stamp duty is payable. And Mr. XYZ is required to make a disclosure of the details of the transaction using the FIRS e-duty platform or the relevant stamp duties uh, commissioner, if he wants to do it uh, face to face. Uh, this is a lot of materials, lots of information, and we still need full clarity over which of these I need to report. And the way I always look at taxes, I look at it from the perception of myself as an individual, not uh, uh, from, from the point of the authorities, because I've spent a lot of my life on the side of the authorities, but the real impact of tax is how it affects real life people for what they are doing, uh, keeping in place um, the canons of taxation, one of which is the canon of simplicity, and the other one is the canon of uh, convenience, uh, neither of which uh, seem to be uh, applicable in this particular area. So FRS says that this will lead to an assessment and payment of the appropriate stamp duties and a consequential issue of a stamp duty certificate or an acknowledgement. And such a, a, a certificate or acknowledgement will suffice as evidence that it has been paid and that the electronic stamp has been, uh, has been uh, uh, stamped appropriately, electronic receipt has been stamped appropriately. Which brings me to on the right hand side, a number of practical questions. And I have to confess up front, I don't have the answers uh, at the moment. It's something I'm still working through. So the transfer to ABZ will first of all have attracted stamp duty at 50 Naira when they made the transfer from the bank to uh, ABZ Limited. At least I presume that's what would happen because the amount is more than 10,000 Naira and the bank under section 89 is mandated to do that. Mr. XYZ, Mark Abani, I've gone to do this. I've sent this money to somebody else. Um, and I will have received a notice from the bank by way of an ATM receipt. So I've been charged 50 Naira on the transfer by the bank. I have now get an ATM receipt. Is that a, a receipt that I need to report to FIRS? I will now, if you set up your account the way I've set up my own, I will also get an SMS, which as we saw there is also a, an electronic um, receipt. Is that receipt also uh, stamp dutyable? And in my own case, I also get an email that tells me what has happened on my account. Is that email stamp dutyable? Where would I start to put the stamp duty? What do I need to report? I will then send to the company uh, a copy. Very often when we make this transfer, the immediate thing you do when you get your, your, your pop-up is to forward it to the company to say, I've got this, I've transferred this money. Have you received it? In the example there, when he acknowledges it, then it's also a stamp stampable uh, uh, transaction. So uh, if he then acknowledges it by SMS, by WhatsApp and by email, there are three of them there in relation to one particular transaction that was done right at the beginning here on which 50 Naira was charged. So which of these receipts come into play uh, and at which of them, or do I need to report all of them? So which of these notices constitute a receipt for stamp duty purposes? The ATM printout, the bank on the transfer, the SMS notice to me, 
They emailed notice to me. There was up notice from the company to me, which is the example that they say attracts uh, stamp duty. So there are quite a number of detailed questions that FIRS still needs to address and provide absolute clarity over what we mean by an electronic receipt, which ones are duplicates of which, and how do I defend myself when FIRS comes knocking on my door and says, you have not paid stamp duty on an ATM receipt, or you have not paid stamp duty on an SMS, which I need to report to myself. We're putting a lot more into the hands of the public to uh, help to res, re, res, um, report these monies and pay these monies over. So my questions around this are, which are they and how realistic are they? I'm leaving that as a question, which I will be exploring much further, but which some people may already have the answer to it, in which case we can all be put out of our agony. These and many similar sorts of uh, transactions in relation to electronic, because the Finance uh, Act 2019 really was focused on bringing electronic receipts and electronic documents and transactions within the stamp duty net. So there still needs to be a lot more explanation of exactly what the implications are, what we need to do, uh, and so on and so forth. So with that one, I will take any questions and thank you very much for listening to me. I think I've done it in just about 30 minutes or just over. Thank you very much, Prof. And thank you very much, professional colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Abani. Honestly, dear participants, you agree with me that we wouldn't have put it better than this. Okay, thank you once again, Dr. However, uh, because of our time, I will not attempt to uh, start revising what you have done. I will not do that, but I will try. Uh, the other time when we were trying to introduce Let us know that Dr. Abani is actually Mark Abani. Sorry, I seem to be missing. I'm not sure if it's my internet. I seem to be missing what you're saying. Prof, I'm sorry, I can't, uh, I can't hear what you're saying. Okay, uh, I was told that uh, we have issue with audio, so I have to repeat myself. But I'd like to let us know that Dr. Abani is a man of many parts and uh, he loves he love agriculture very well. Like I was saying the other time before the interruption from the network, he's a first class honor graduate of UNN. 
He also obtained a PhD from that same uh, university. He is a certified task administration diagnostic assessment tools and is an assessor uh, for IMF and World Bank. Dr. Abani is a fellow of Nigerian Institute of Management, the Institute of Credit Administrator, the Institute of Agribusiness Managers of Nigeria, a member of CITN among the various uh, associations that he belongs to. We have quite a long list of uh, questions for him, and I quickly want to run through that. question across. Please ensure your system is named. Otherwise, name appropriately so that we can read your question. Uh, one of our members here, Dr. Abani, I'll, I'll be giving you like two or three questions together to answer. Just help us jot it and also make use of question and answer uh, platform on your system to also question. But let me leave from here where you pick up. Uh, Uzoka Gabriel is asking that uh, is there any question as to what stamp duty will be in terms of the fact that uh, if a landlord charges a kind of amount, are we going to put uh, stamp duty on the total amount of rent or there will be a specific amount that we are going to charge. So in, 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 in short, the question is about what are going to have um, stamp duty on rent? Is it the value of the rent or that's a specific amount? That is from one of the attendees. Um, will you want to answer that, sir? Yeah, well, okay. Would you want um, to answer that first, Dr. Abani? Because sure. it will solve a lot of problems. Can you can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Um, if if let me assume that you can hear me. Um, the the question is very germane. Um, basically, is the stamp duty on the amount you pay per month, or is it on a full annual rent. Um, whatever you pay per month, depending on the agreement, your agreement will not be rolling month by month. Your agreement will be for a specified period of the lease. So it will be the first applicable percentage on the entire amount of the lease for the period of the lease. So if one million for six weeks for six months then your rate will be calculated based on the rate that applies to 1 million for six months. If it's 1 million for a year, then it will also uh, apply for that particular period. Uh, if you are running it, so it's one year, six months, and then you go into another agreement for six months, then a new rate will apply. Now, I haven't cross-checked that. It's a very interesting question but it immediately gives rise to the question of contract splitting. Are you going to try and write your lease in such a way that you attract the least amount of ad valorem charge uh, in order to um, effectively avoid stamp duties? Uh, I suspect you will not be able to do that one, but uh, I'm happy to check that further. I hope that answers that question. And of course, if you're paying monthly and getting a receipt every month, the 15 naira for each of those seats will apply. Hello? Thank you, Dr. Abani. <laughs> okay, I have a quite uh, similar question here in which I will not attempt to repeat. Uh, membership number 15811 and uh, Uzoka Gabriel of uh, Three five five two. They are all asking similar questions, 
And uh, I, I want to take it that your explanation now and that of calculation you gave us in your case study should survive. Okay, let me quickly go to that of patient Kanti. He's asking you to throw more light on the implementation of stamp duty. I, I, I want to be tempted to say maybe we should defer this question because we already have uh, a, a kind of session for implementation. But Dr. Avani, in order not to look at see if you don't know it, because I know you know it, will you use 60 seconds in attempting that particular concern? Thank you, sir. Uh, once laws are passed, they become implementable immediately. It's the shortest possible answer I can give. So the Finance Act uh, 2019, the Amendment 2019, and the initial uh, uh, principal law are both effective, so they are both uh, running. Now, you, the FRS may decide certain administrative dates to continue, but in law, it's running already. Thank you, sir. We have Mr. Matthew Salako asking that is money transferred from one bank by an individual or corporate made to another bank in the same bank detailable? Uh, I don't want to say you have attempted this, but can you just shed more light on their side? Um, transfers from one bank to another, or indeed within a bank, to any account that is not your own, same BVN will attract stamp duty. Thank you, Dr. Abani. You can never be tired of uh, uh, you all the time. Please, you are not permitted to leave your seats. You will still be part of, <laughs> you will still be part of the panelists until we are done for today. Uh, while you sit back, as I collate um, questions from the YouTube, I would like to quickly bring on board uh, another facilitator for today. Okay, I, I, I think there's only one uh, question from YouTube that we can take on. It's from uh, Fola Sholu and Bottom. Is asking is stamp duty on contract agreements on value of contract before VAT or after VAT? You've answered similar question, but this time around, a button is trying to bring another dynamics into it, especially when it comes to issue of VAT. What would your response be to this, sir? Uh, my understanding is that it applies on the value before VAT. You cannot be stamping VAT as well. You can't stamp a tax. <laughs> Is it ready? Where is it? Is it doing it? I hope that's clear. Um, well, I wouldn't know whether the um, the questionnaire is around. However, we we take it that we are fine. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. My boss, sit back. I will be monitoring you. Don't go away <laughs> because. Question may come at any time. And that's why we are here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. The civic thank members you. and participants here, uh, thank you for your time. We, we want you to take a minute breath, stop like that. And uh, as we await the next uh, paper presenter to come on board. OK? Uh, the next paper presenter is also one of the elders in the profession, and uh, his name is Chief Elder Uzoma Francis Ubani, FCTI. Uh, Chief Ubani, please, I wouldn't really want you to mistake this name to offer the uh, just <laughs> concluded paper presenter. Uh, the, the name sounds like that, I wouldn't even know whether they are from the same state. But what is important to us is that Uba and Abani are making us proud in our institute. Uh, Chief Ubani Francis Uzoma holds MBA and several professional qualifications relevant to what we are discussing, and as such, is a member of our institute. He is the managing consultant, chief executive of his uh, firm. 
Marcos Consultants Group. He obtained his BSc and MBA degree in strategic business and management. He is also a solicitor and has other professional qualifications, like I said the other time. He belongs to many professional bodies, including uh, CITN and others with over 25 years experience in tax matters. And when he says 25 years, 25 years is strictly in tax matter and this, not 25 years as a graduate. He's highly skilled in tax issues and matters, entrepreneurship and business development, strategic planning, management, and skill training. He has also attended many tax and management conferences, seminars, workshops, workshop, both locally and internationally. He is happily married with children and widely traveled. Uh, I want to bring on board Elder Van uh, Ubani, if he's on board, let him come up. Chief Ubani, please unmute yourself and come on board. While we are waiting for him, I want to confirm if uh, Mr. Howdu Gona Johnson is around. If you are around, please, can you unmute yourself and say hi to us? Howdu, are you there? And how do you unmute yourself and talk to us? We are trying to fix um, Elder Uzoma to be on board. Okay, uh, Elder Barney, you can now unmute yourself. You are, you are now on the panelist list. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, the moderator. Yes, I am happy to be here to discuss the uh, issue of my passion. Uh, first of all, I'm called upon today uh, to discuss the implementation of Stamp Duties Act in Nigeria. I see this call as putting the round peg in the round hole as far as Stamp Duties Act is concerned. And I must add that it is a great honor to me, and I will not take this honor for granted. On this note, I thank most sincerely the current leadership of our great institute, the CITN, and the council members for deeming me fit to present a paper 
on this topic that has been my passion for a very long time. Thank you very much, my president. Thank you, Professor Godwin Oyedukun, for nominating me. Now let's go straight to the topic, stamp duties, implementation, and effects on stakeholders. As a technical advisor on the implementation of stamp duties act to several states in Nigeria, I am in a better position to discuss this subject to the benefit of all concerned. Kindly listen attentively, please. The first slide uh, is where my name is. Now, the introduction, I don't really need to waste my time on introduction. The introduction is all about um, the three tiers of government in Nigeria, the federal, the state, and the local government. So I'm going straight to slide five. Um, we resolved to present this paper for two reasons. One, as concerned Nigerian citizen, and two, as technical advisor through consultants to state governments on stamp duties. This is so because we know that states need as much funds as they can be able to generate through the implementation of the Stamp Duties Act as it released state governments. The passage of the Act 2019 the General Assembly, some workers of the Nigerian Postal Service protested at the National Assembly. Their complaint was that the Federal Inland Revenue Service, instead of NIPOST, was given the powers to collect stamp duties in Nigeria. They went on to state erroneously, though, that the provisions of the Stamp Duties Act and the NIPOST Act has given them sole power to collect stamp duties in Nigeria. Now, se Section 2 of the Stamp Duties Act defines stamp. Define stamp as to meet or stamp to for denoting a duty or fee. By this definition, the stamp in the Stamp Duties Act means that it may be impressed on a document either of thoughts through die impressed stamp or through adhesive stamp. This law is not defined anywhere to mean or include postage stamp. What it envisaged is instrument to be presented for stamp duty will fall into two categories. These are documents evidencing transactions between a company and anyone.
Hello. I think we are having issue with a uh, network from our side here. We will resolve it now. Hello. Okay, uh, I, I think. Uh... Olga Ubani, we need you up again. Please check your connection and let's quickly have you back. Check your connection. Yes. Um, do we have uh, Mr. Haldu in the house? Mr. Haldu, if you are in the house, let us see you. We need to bring you on board immediately. However, while we are doing that, Ms. Uh, Dr. Nandele Rotimi, please unmute yourself and come on board to continue your discussion. Mr. Nandele Rotimi, please come on board. Yeah. Mr. Nandele Rotimi, we are waiting for yes, you now. I'm, yes, I'm with you, sir. Uh, greetings to the house. Um, I, I will sincerely uh, commend the presentation made by Dr. Abani. Dr. Abani, are you hearing me, sir? Please, unmute yourself and come on board, please. I can hear you. Okay. Are you hearing me? Hello? I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello, yes, we can all hear you. We can all hear you. Continue, sir. Okay. Yes, I, I'm standing on the system protocol. Sincerely speaking, I must commend the presentation of uh, Dr. Abani. The presentation is highly informative and educative. Dr. Abani took us so down the memory. Seems to hear you at all. I can't seem to hear you at all. I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. We are hearing hearing you. Hearing you. We we'll have to bring back on board Dr. Abani. Uh, I noticed Dr. Abani has been attending to some uh, issues. Dr. Abani, can you just take like two few minutes to quickly uh, attend to those questions that you are trying to attend to underneath? 
publicly so that others can gain from it. Hello, I'm hearing you clearly. I'm Prof, uh, Mr. Rotumi, I can hear him. I don't know if he wants to conclude. Okay, 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 okay. fine. Mr. Rotumi, uh, uh, please, you're on board. Thank you very much. As earlier, as earlier said, I, I sincerely commend the presentation just made by Dr. Abani. It is informative and educative. The presentation took us down the memory lane, right from the origin of stamp duty, which happens to be the subject of discourse. This is the amendment, the Finance Act amendment, which is uh, which happens to be the bone of contention. Dr. Abani. Uh, technically examine the uh, the basis. Dr. Abani, Abani was able to tell us the uh, the the type of uh, stamp duty, and he also was able to uh, expatiate clearly on the old law, and was able to compare the two. Uh, at the previous law with the existing law, pointing out the inadequacies of the old law, that the new uh, existing amendment, the Finance Act, has been able to address. So also it was able to address the structures inherent. Ditto the issue with the uh, stamp duties and the uh, And those uh, amendments, most especially to that of uh, Section uh, 2, that, uh, <clears throat> that explained the, Section 2, the amendment in Section 2 that actually include uh, uh, electronic uh, uh, documents as part of those uh, items that are supposed to uh, that upon which stamp duty will be charged. So also <clears throat> the presentation was able to uh, clear the coast as regards the, the authority, because initially there, were, there was a, a, a kind of a, a issue as to who should actually describe, who should collect, who should charge and collect a stamp duty. The presentation actually uh, puts uh, actually uh, through more light to this. In addition to what are the presentation, I think there were reasons for the there. Were for the amendment. One of the reasons is, uh, is to reform the uh, domestic tax law in Nigeria in line with the business and economic reality. So also to address the uh, tax gap between our uh, uh, tax and the GDP. As you can see, the, 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 the tax to GDP ratio has been so uh, uh, is incomparable when compared with those uh, other West Africa. Besides, it will expand, it has expanded the task base. And can you the court again? Can you see? Hello, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We can hear you. Thank you, sir. Please, can you move yourself over there so that uh, we, can, we can hear others? Okay, why we are doing that, I'd like to quickly call on board uh, one of our elders in profession. 
the person of uh, Mr. Albert Follow-Shaw. Mr. Albert Follow-Shaw, please, on your video and unmute yourself to talk to us. Albert Follow-Shaw. Hello? Mr. Abelfollonsho, are you there? Yes, please, I'm here. We want, we like to see your face, if possible. I've, I've muted it already. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, you, 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 you've been here with us and uh, you are known for your activities within the class environment. Your intelligence and uh, dexterity within the space of tradition can never be on the I can't hear you. I, I can't hear him either. I can't. Uh, Dr. Avani, can you hear uh, Pro? No, I can't hear him. Albert, how are you? <laughs> Very well. Good morning. Well done. Good morning. Well done. Albert, can you hear what I've just said? Can you hear what I've just said? I can't. No, not really. No, not really. Okay, let me repeat myself. Sorry about that. What I'm trying to say is that you are known for your activities in space for transition. This is the issue of tax policy and the parts of Finance Act 2019, in which a particular session of same talks about stamp duty. What do you think is the mind of draft of that um, bill that became eventually act? Which are these stamp duty? Can you just take us through within the next five minutes, sir? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, of course, the. Stamp Duties Act of 1939 has been in existence, but of course um, the implementation has not been uh, what was expected. And of course there's this controversy that was going on uh, between uh, who, which relevant authority uh, should collect uh, stamp duty. Uh, NIPOS uh, was at the forefront uh, with FRS. So it's just now that FRS is also taking it um, uh, seriously. So the Finance Act's intention was to clarify and make it very clear to uh, taxpayers and tax authorities, the, the, the relevant tax uh, authority. And uh, very clearly, what the Finance Act says is that it is the uh, Federal Inland Revenue Service or the State Internal Revenue Service that are responsible for the collection and administration of stamp duty. Uh, that was the one, uh, one of the main points. The second point that the finance has tend to do was to make it clear that uh, just like it's applicable in other, other countries, electronic transactions are also eligible uh, for, are also duty-able. So the uh, finance has made it clear that it is not only where you have instruments, or documents that uh, where you have electronic transaction stamp duty should also apply. And so uh, the controversy that we still have today is the misunderstanding of the relevant authority, particularly by some states, okay? And it is very clear in the law that says that where the transaction is between a person and a company, the, the duty is payable to the Federal Revenue Service. But where the transaction is between two individuals, the duty is payable to the state. And so we must understand that if you have Mr. A and Mr. B, Mr. A being the tenant and Mr. B the, being the, um, the landlord, okay, that is an, a rent agreement. Now, the rent agreement is between two individuals in that case, and the stamp duty on that particular rent agreement, you know, goes to the state where the uh, beneficiary is resident. But of course, when rent is to be paid, it must be made through a transfer through the bank. And so there is another transaction in that case, which is the transfer of fund. So there's, that one has to do with an agreement between the transferor and the bank. And it's saying that if, you, if I give you this instruction and you fail to carry it out and there is litigation, I should be able to present 
my paying slip as an evidence in court. So that does not mean that uh, an individual is involved. It is an individual and a company, and the, and the stamp duty goes to this Federal Inland Revenue Service. Those are very key uh, clarification I would like to make so that um, uh, a lot of the states that are pursuing uh, this 50-50 Naira should understand that it is truly payable to the Federal Inland Revenue Service. Okay, um, those are the few points I would like to raise. I have also sent it a question, uh, which I believe uh, our technical people will address, which has to do with where a loan is granted by a multinational institution. Definitely there has to be a loan agreement. And so the question is, is the loan agreement dutable? Okay, if the multinational institution is exempted from tax, is still the, is, is there, will there still be stamp duty? What of if uh, the person taking the security in that case is the foreign entity, the multilateral institution, compared to the Nigerian bank that is taking the loan? Where will the stamp duty go? Those are things I, uh, I would like our, some of our presenters to also address. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, kudos to the Institute for taking this step. Okay, thank you. Uh... Mr. Albert Follonshaw, my boss, please, you cannot attempt to come here in form of pastor to come and be. Huh? I didn't hear the question. Hello? I can't hear you. Sorry, Prof. You, we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Question back to <laughs> You are called, right? No, I'm not on call, I'm with you. Okay, fine. But I'm trying to say this, that you cannot come in that form to come and tell us that we should be answering questions for you. Rather, you are there to also solve most of this problem as one of the key uh, uh, resource person in this arena. A question is coming from one row here. And uh, I'll be following short, please, you have to help us with this. The primary and secondary school are not for public making organization and therefore not liable to tax. Are they liable to stamp duty or receipt of school fee? And before your, your, your time starts now. Okay, well, the exemption that is the Stamp Duties Act specifically applies to um, government. Any duty that is, any instrument that gives obligation to government to pay the duty the duty is exempted. It's like uh, a, a client was clarifying for me yesterday that uh, all these government accounts, local government accounts, government accounts, and all that, are they supposed to charge a uh, term duty? And the rule is that the omnibus provision at the end of the, of the schedule is that any duty payable by government is exempt. They are not supposed to pay. So if the school is not a government school, it's a private school, and all receipts, are supposed to be dutable at the fixed duty of 15 naira. There is no, the fact that a company or an institution is exempted from corporate or income tax does not exempt you from stamp duty payment. And I think that is very straightforward. Thank you, my boss. Uh, please don't go yet. Uh, I quickly want to bring this to you. Uh, somebody is asking here if you can just go to a post office and buy equivalent of that stamp duty uh, stamp and a fixed on durable uh, <laughs> instrument without necessarily waiting for FRS and IRS. Uh, how will you react to this, sir? Well, the provision of the Act allows uh, stamp duty to be paid either uh, through the use of adhesive, adhesive stamp. And the adhesive stamp was ordinarily only being produced by the, by the post office. So truly, if you go to the post office, uh, before now, okay, and buy adhesive stamp to the tune of whatever the stamp duty you are supposed to pay, and you are fixed it, you know, on the on the instrument. You have paid your stamp duty, but of course, uh, FRS have said that they who are now the authority responsible for collection of stamp duty from uh, transaction involving individuals and corporate body, you cannot just go to the post office now and buy because the money is not going to FRS since they have the authority now to collect stamp duty. A couple of clients have also requested for, okay, where will the, how will we get FRS adhesive stamp? 
and I've also inquired, and I think maybe they are working on that. But um, the truth is that the Lord did not say you must go to the post office and buy adhesive stamp. FRS can produce, and uh, if they make it available, it will be enough to ensure that uh, an instrument has been uh, properly, uh, 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 stamp duty has properly been paid. We must also recognize the fact that stamp duty is compulsory because it says that in section 12 that uh, stamp duty must be paid at the time an instrument is first executed, okay? And that in, uh, we move further that if you fail to pay within 40 days or 30 days, depending on whether it is at valorum duty or fixed duty, that the penalty of uh, 20 Naira will apply. Again, when you talk about penalty now, the question is, which one is the applicable one? Is it the one in the Stamp Duties Act or in the one in the FRS Establishment Act? The FRS Establishment Act says that the law in the FRS Establishment Act supersede all other tax laws. So which means it will subsume the penalty in the Stamp Duties Act and impose the one in the FRS Establishment Act. So instead of this 2020 Naira, we may have to deal with 10% penalty plus interest at the road village. These are some of the issues that I believe has to be addressed before full implementation will continue. Thank you very much. Oh, okay, I bet you cannot run away. I, you just made another point in which I wanted to clarify. Uh, as somebody that is learning from every one of us here, you just made mention of the supremacy of FRS Establishment Act as supposed to uh, order tax law. Are you saying draft of that law and the say that there will be a future task law and that future task law will not have potency of FRS establishment act? What's your mind about this, sir? Well, some of the provisions, some of the other tax law, if you go to even CETA, it says notwithstanding any provision, I mean, section 16 on insurance, for example, says notwithstanding any provision in this act. It depends, the, the establishment act, the FRS establishment act, cover taxes that are to be administered by the Federal Inland Revenue Service. And he says specifically that the provision in that act in terms of administration supersedes any of the provision in the specific acts that they, are, they have power to administer. So, and if you go to the list, one of the taxes to be administered by FRS in the FRS Establishment Act is Time Duties Act. So which means where there are you know, um, uh, differences in the provisions in the FRS Establishment Act and that of uh, taxes like stamp duty. Of course, we expect that the stamp duty, I mean, the FRS Establishment Act should uh, supersede and we may have to, uh, those clarifications are required. For me, I believe that some of these things need to be tidied up before the wholesale implementation. And I've always said that a law that was made in 1939 we cannot wake up today and begin to implement without enlightenment, which the FRS have started. Thank, Thank you, my boss, once again. But um, I will allow you to go after this one last question from my side to you. Um, you, you please don't go. Uh, somebody is trying to ask, especially Idris Olufobi, that for fund received via bank account, isn't, isn't the bank that is supposed to, uh, uh, to be a receiving agent, will FRS come after the recipients or the collecting agent? Uh, let me take it again. For funds received via bank accounts, isn't the bank that is collecting agents, would FRS come after the recipient or collecting agent? Well, you know that um, banks uh, as an institution have a dual role which means they also pay tax and they are more or less compulsory agent of tax authority, though not paid for, or sometimes they get paid anyway, okay, to render a, a service to the, to the government. So uh, they are the soft target and usually the FRS expect that they carry out those duties. They are the one that uh, will account for those uh, taxes, particularly stamp duty on transfer. They are, they are responsible for accounting where they fail to deduct. And that is why we saw recently a, a bank that uh, failed to deduct stamp duty for a few months, uh, decided to, uh, when they charged their, their, their customer, the customer shouted and they reversed the transfer and decided to pay the, the stamp duty on behalf of the, of, the, of the customers. So definitely it is the bank that has the obligation to 
account for the stamp duty. I don't expect FRS to start going after individual on, on, on bank transfer. That is not likely to happen. Even to go after small companies on receipt, which means you need to go from shop to shop. You know, I mean, FRS is not going to do that. They are institutions, they are significantly big institutions that I expect they will focus on uh, after uh, all these rates uh, that are now the issue have been tidied up because we have rates that are specific in the Stamp Duties Act. We don't expect anybody to, uh, to implement any rates outside those ones. The Joint House Board cannot change the rates except the National Assembly, and we expect those ones to be addressed. Thank you. You're expecting me to have more questions, but I will not do so now. Thank you very uh, I much. I want to call on board Dr. Titila Okon. Please unmute yourself and be ready for some challenges from some of our members here via their questions sent to us. Uh, Dr. Titi Okon, please unmute yourself. If possible, let us see your face as we have a few questions for you. Dr. Titi Okon. Can we can we see your face, please? please can you have your seat? Thank you. Uh, Titi, you are welcome on board. Good morning. Sorry for morning. this uh, impromptu. Uh, oh, good morning, sister. Okay. We have some concern here, and I want to see how you want to respond to this in order to, to, to help our members. And the question is from John Okwala. How will task official review electronic transaction? Where does the review start? Is it from the bank statement or from phones? That is SMS, WhatsApp, or from network company? Uh, let, let, let me recap what this uh, person is trying to ask. We know we cannot do without audit later. How will task authority go about this? Uh, ch chances are that task authority will also pick from what we're discussing. Titi, you have the floor. Titi, you have muted yourself again. Can you unmute yourself, please? To, to come on. Um, it's going to be, for me, it's going to be a daisy one. Uh, but I, I think um, with the way the tax authorities are going, uh, you know, now you cannot file your returns without your BVN. Um, they have access to bank accounts. Uh, they can actually review your bank account without your permission. So I believe it is something that is possible, but the, 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 the facility and the access may be a challenge for a start. So I don't see it as something that can be immediate with the way things, with the way things are now. Uh, for instance, personally, I don't think I, 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 somebody uh, would just tell the bank, okay, release my account and they will release, but the bank will not come to me because of the last time we had all these problems with uh, freezing of accounts, which still happened sometime this year that we still see happen. So I guess the FRS has a tool uh, that they could um, use to, to, to equip themselves for this task. But I'm not seeing it as something that can happen in the immediate. If it could be later, but as it is now, then. There's still that fear over uh, over the internet um, fraud and things like that. So people are so skeptical about this. But if they were going to be able to do this, it could be later, but not an immediate uh, action uh, possibility. Thank you for that. So who is the relevant task authority to collect stamp duty on banking transaction, especially transaction between individuals? That's from uh, Bashir Rahman. Um, well, it, the law is clear uh, about um, stamp duties that relates to individuals, and that is, um, it goes to the states. So if, for instance, I can give you an instance of Lagos State, now if you go for your filing, you have to put in your BVN, you have to put all those information. So anything that has to do with state goes to, uh, the individuals go to the state. But if it has to do with corporate bodies, it goes to FIRS. So there will still need, be need for states and FIRS to to have a way of handling this between the two of them because banking transactions is a mix of both individuals and, um, and corporates, but they can be separated. Then leave machine along uh, Lutz Road and uh, with my rent agreement, 
my landlord decided to buy postage stamp and put it. Sunday, Adamoleko is now asking, what is the issue here? Okay. Um, it is clear that the stamp that we are talking about under the stamp duty, as at today, based on FRS establishment, um, sorry, based on the stamp duties act and the amendments in the finance act, is not talking about the stamp you go and get in post office and put on it. And like the earlier speaker uh, explained, the FRS is to, supposed to make sure that this stamp is available. Now, the challenge will not be this. FRS is saying they are working on the stamp. But as an individual, my stamp duty goes to the state. Are the states going to now get from the FRS the stamp for them to now give to each of the individuals in their states? Those are the uh, administrative side which needs to be looked into. Uh, then how easy will it be? Because most of these rent, uh, they, they don't even pay tax. Um, I'm sorry to use that word. They tell the tenant that my rent is my rent. Uh, whatever tax you want to deduct, I don't care. Just make sure you go and deduct. But as it is now, states, I'm not even sure LRS has the capacity to determine individuals that collect rent and don't pay tax. So it's it's quite, going to be quite a, a bit of a challenging one for this. So that's the way it is not getting the stamp from post office. We're talking of a system as defined by the Finance Act, which as of today is not yet in, in circulation. So the challenge that we may also have is that now a systems are not ready. Are we not going to apply this in retrospect? Is it going to be a retrospective application? That's also, we, we will not say, oh, okay, are there systems are not ready now? Uh, maybe they get ready in the next three months. All the rent agreements, all the contracts that you've not done before, before now, you must bring it, collect it, and do the, the stamping now. Those are also the administrative challenges that will come up, which needs to be looked into. It's good. We are trying to do this stamp duty act, but the administration is what needs to be watertight, or else the objective may not be met. Thank you, Titi. Okay, uh, on the last note from our side here, how will you respond to this? Is FRS in position of a 0.125% stamp duty on the unsecured loan agreement legger? Uh, what will you say to that? Uh, well, you, I, I, already, I, already have, I already have some reactions uh, when this came up, and um, it's likely we are going to see uh, some pressure groups coming together on, on some of these aspects that we, we have here. Now, when you start talking about whether it's legal or illegal, you have to look at what we're talking about. Uh, the, the tax, the Stamp Duty Act is what defines what is to be stamped, what is not to be stamped. The banking documents they are talking about also come under another, another regulation, which is coming under the banking regulation. So there must be some level of handshake between these two laws to some extent that to make it workable. And we know this is where we have big, the, the big, big transactions. So in terms of revenue drive, FR is likely to get the revenue coming from this. But when you talk about illegal or not illegal, there's a law that says it should be paid. And as long as that law is, is signed, is sealed by the president uh, and is applicable for the country, we cannot talk of illegal illegality. We may be now looking at aligning the different laws that guide those transactions and be sure that uh, there's no multiplicity of, of uh, pressure on the, on the taxpayers. Because if you're not careful, the effect of stamp duty would be more on the taxpayers if other laws are not aligned to make sure that the, 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 the economy, the situation of the economy is not worse off on, on the taxpayers when this law comes to full execution. Okay, I'm tempted to ask this final, final, final uh, question. Uh, this particular stand duty that we're talking about, FIFA more, Go, uh, government rather than the uh, taxpayer. What would be your reaction as somebody that is preaching that we should also always be on the path of the law? Can I, do you want me to repeat myself? I, I, if you can, just summarize it. I need to be Okay, so uh, what I'm saying is this, this issue of uh, stamp duty, will you agree that it's favor government more than the citizen? Yes, it favors government more than the citizen. <laughs> It's a source of government revenue. You know, 
everybody is looking at you, given some, as far as I'm concerned, even if you said small and medium are not paying income tax, they'll pay stamp duty. So it's really not that they are getting full benefits. And even there are some even amendments that are still going to affect them. So it's for, the, it's for government revenue generation. Because for the taxpayers, they are going to pay more. Something that so you've not been paying some things, you have a lower rate of stamping, stamp duty before, you now have a higher rate to pay, definitely you're going to be affected. And it will affect the cost of doing business. Because well, okay, Titi, are you looking at this from Titi, are you looking at this from merits and social goals that government can uh, make available to the citizenry? Uh, are you looking at it in that uh, regard as yes, well? I'm looking at that. I'm looking at it in that regard because you see, one thing is for government to generate revenue. Let, let's look at it. For instance, the purpose of the revenue generation of government is that they will be able to make social amenities available to the citizenry. But we don't have that yet. We still have problems in that area. So you are saying that taxpayers will not have to increase what is committed to the government. When you talk about total tax contribution, stamp duty now will form a part of that total tax contribution for any taxpayer. You match that, marry that to what is the commensurate economic benefit in terms of social amenities that the taxpayers enjoy. And that is where you will see that the taxpayer is still at the receiving end all the way even when it comes to the implementation of the Stamp Duty Act, as it is. Thank you, Titi. Thank you, Titi. That will be fine for now. Uh, I have in the house one of our past presidents in person of uh, Chief MCDK. Chief MCDK, you are now on the, uh, on the board. Can you just unmute yourself? If possible, can we see your face? As you have few questions to answer. MCDK, over to you, sir. Yes. Chief MACDK, can you unmute yourself and uh, come on board? While we are waiting for you, the paper presenter is ready, and that is uh, Eda Ubani. Eda Ubani. Okay, MACDK, I see you unmuting yourself. Can you, can you just uh, talk to us so that we can confirm you are here with us? Sir? Hello, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Yodeku. Very good job. Thank you, sir. Glad to be on. Uh, your thank time you. is very, very short when it comes to this discussion. But uh, we allow our spirit here to guide you so that you, you will tell us within this space of time the concern of Cornelius, who is saying Section 56 of Stamp Duty Act deals specifically with contracts for sales of goods. The heart is, however, silent on contract for service. The heart provides in this schedule that where it is silent on any transaction, a duty of five cobalt is applicable. As a former director of tax policy with Federal Land Revenue, we you still want to tell us that this issue of 50 cobalt survives? We you want to Acts to the Section 56 of Stamp Duty Act as it should be applicable today. Sir, feel free to elaborate. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Professor Yodeku. Um, you just uh, I just said uh, we're participating, you know, and then listening as um, as a general participant. Uh, so, uh, but I think uh, one key issue. Um, in the outstanding duties, amendments, and the rest of them is the issue of, as always been said, you talk about the base for standard duties, you talk about the value added tax. It's a critical issue that uh, needs to be you know, done. That's, that's um, a process, I'm not sure that had been, we started it before I left the service. Uh, I'm not sure that process has been completed. Uh, it needs to be taken on board to be sure that there's no double dipping uh, when you look at stamp duties and value added tax. It cannot be collecting stamp duty upon VAT or VAT upon stamp duty. It's an issue, it's a work in pro, you know, uh, progress that needs to be resolved as quickly as possible uh, for us. In That's what I, 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 I need to say as a general comment. My past president. 
Thank you so much for that. And I can be, I, I'm so sure that you are secured over there because I can uh, get some background vacuums uh, uh, and uh, supernatural security over there. Uh, another dimension to this is the concern from Wally Sam. He said, with the trend of uh, the usage of tax revenue by people in governments, uh, will it be out of place to put a clause in our tax law that dictates penalty on tax revenue mismanagement? Do you have anything to tell us on this? Sorry, come again. Sorry. I... Okay, one of our members is trying to ask us, that is Wally Sam, that uh, will you consider subsequent tax law to have a clause that dictates penalties for mismanagement of tax revenue? Absolutely, yes. Because uh, when we talk about the various stakeholders in the tax system, we try to talk about those who are the collectors and then those who are also the spenders. Because uh, in my experience as a tax administrator, each time we go, you know, as a tax auditor or a tax investigator, uh, the tax administrator or tax collector is the face for collecting tax revenue for government. Whether the money that is so collected is used efficiently and exclusively to provide public goods and services or not, these things are visited on the tax collector. But with us, people always forget that you also have those who are spending that money for which the tax collector has no control over. And therefore, those who are spending tax revenue that's collected, they are making the job of the tax collector very difficult. So it is very important, really, because uh, when you go back to the basics, what is the purpose of taxation? You, you, know, you, 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 you levy tax so as to provide public goods and services. Uh, these public goods and services being provided by the government for the tax that people pay. And if the answer is not yes, then that is a problem. And they need to see, go back to these basics. And so uh, that's the way to look at the whole thing. So we need to also be capital. Those who are spending that money, they're making the job of collecting more revenue, you know, difficult because people want to see value for the money that they are paid to government. That was past president, MSCDK, former uh, director of tax policy, Federal Land Revenue Service. Thank you, sir, for your time. And I quickly uh, bring on board the paper presenter, uh, Edda Ugani Uzuma. Uh, he will be dwelling more now on the effect of this SAM duty implementation on stakeholders. Uh, Elder Ugani, please, you can now come on board. Thank you. Thank you very much. We stopped. Um, sorry for the mix up. It's just an uh, internet connection. Please forgive me for the mix up. However, now, as I was saying, Section 2 of the Stamp Duties Act defines stamp to mean a stamp impressed by means of die or as a addressing stamp for denoting any duty or fee. By this definition, the stamp in the Stamp Duties Act means a stamp may be impressed on a document through either method through a die impressed press, stamp or through or an aggressive stamp. stamp. This law does not define stamp anywhere to mean or include postage stamp. What it envisaged was that instruments which would be presented for stamp duty will fall into two categories. These are documents evidencing transactions between a company and anyone, companies and an individual, group or body of individuals in line with Section 41 of the Stamp Duties Act, and those between persons or individuals in line with Section 4 of Section 2. With this 
distinction, the law of in federal physical federalism, when in section four or section two, it provides follows the relevant tax authority and duties in respect to instruments executed between banks and others. At such at rates, rates of imposed or charged as may be agreed with the federal government. The, the message from this, from this section, section of the stamp duty is that the revenue, the stamp duty revenue, revenue, is collectible, is, collectible, is not collectible by federal government alone. alone. The states, by constitutional by entitlement, have vested interest in collecting the stamp duty. Now, again, this law did not contemplate the Nigerian Postal Service. Whatever name it had then as, a, as an agency had been in existence before the enactment of stamp duties. It is therefore unfortunate that stamp night post is bent on appropriating to itself powers that it does not have to the detriment of the states. On Tuesday, May 8, 2018, a bill sponsored by NIPOST was passed by the National Assembly and thereafter was communicated to President Mohamed Bukhari for accent. The President, upon advice of the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of the Federation, Mr. Bubaka Malami Han, refused to sign the bill into law. The advice was anchored on a reading of the Stamp Duties Act, which the Attorney General rightly interpreted as revenue legislation, having nothing to do with NIPOST. As a matter of fact, this is not the first time the NIPOST leadership would show a determination to take over the administration of stamp duties by all means. They have deployed the administrative and the judicial means in the past to arrive at the same end, but all had failed woefully. Now, because of time we have lost, now the NIPOS functions and the Stamp Duties Act. It is very clear and very obvious that none of the above stated functions and powers have any relationship with Stamp Duties Act. To those who equate stamp in the Stamp Duties Act with stamp that NIPO sells, it is important to state here categorically that they are not the same. NIPO sells postage stamps, while the Stamp Duties Act provides for the use of adhesive stamps. Adhesive revenue stamps. Section 5 of the Stamp Duties Act provides that all duties chargeable under the Act shall be paid and denoted except where express provision is made to the contrary by impressed stamps only. Now, state governments as major stakeholders. Stamp Duties Act recognizes state governments as major stakeholders in its implementation. As part of the provisions of, apart from the provisions of section 4.2 earlier mentioned, section six confers state governors with powers to appoint commissioners of stamp duties who are charged with this care and management of stamp duties under the act that are due to their state. In the same way, the president appoints federal commissioners. Stamp duty collected by the FIRS is to be returned to the states in equal proportion of the net proceeds of the duty that are derived from each state. And in section three, subsection two of the Stamp Duties Act provides that the duties charged under this act shall be accounted for by the Minister of Finance in consultation with the governors of the states as to the amount collected by the FIRS. Now, Section 
section 41 of the stamp duties act is very clear and the demarcation is very clear it provides to us the federal government shall be the only competent authority to impose charge and collect stamp duties upon instrument specified in the schedule to this act if and only if such instruments relate to matters executed between a company and an individual group or body of individuals section 53a has amended it now to read instead of the federal government shall is now the federal inland revenue service shall now there is a demarcation between the section 41 and section 42 clearly defined by the act section 42 of the stamp duties act provides us the state governments shall collect duties in respect of instruments executed between persons or individuals at such rates to be imposed or charged as may be agreed with the federal government. And section 53B of the Finance Act also amended the word the state government and replaced them with the relevant tax authorities in a state. Now, powers of the governor of a state to make regulations. Section 115 provides that in addition to the powers conferred on him by section 15 and 105 of this act, the governor of a state may make regulations relating to the custody of the dies to be used under this act, to the circumstances in which allowances shall be made for spoil stamps, to the accounting for the revenue derived from stamp duties, to the substitution of adhesive stamps for or of impressed stamps for adhesive stamps or of revenue stamps for postage stamp and the revenue stamps. Now, the import of this is that in absence of revenue stamps, you can quickly go to the post office and get posters, post, um, uh, postage stamp to affix in that particular transaction so that you don't miss it. And then to the further and better carrying into effect of the objects and purposes of this act. Now, the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in section 162 provides for distributable pool account known as and called the Federation account, where all public funds are paid into and distributed thereafter through the advice from the Revenue Mobilization Allocation and Physical Commission. In section 163, it provides for allocation of other revenues. And in item D, part two, second schedule, clearly stated what the other revenues are. It is obvious that the 1999 constitution recognized and made provisions for two types of revenues. One is to be treated as pool revenue, public revenue, on the distributable pool account, while the other is to be treated as consolidated revenue of a state, very clearly provided. The constitution in section 163B went on to state very clearly that where such tax or duty is collected by the government of the federation or other authority of the federation, there shall be paid to each state a sum equal to the proportion of the net proceeds of such tax or duty that are derived from that state. Now, I have reproduced section 163 of the 1999 constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria for ease of reference. Now, constitutional provision on stamp duties. Section 163 of the 1999 constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria provides to us, where under an act of the National Assembly, tax or duty is imposed 
in respect of any of the matters specified in item D of part two of the second schedule to this constitution. The net proceeds of such tax or duty shall be distributed among the states on the basis of derivation and accordingly, where such tax or duty is collected by the government of a state or other authority of the state, like IRS of the states, the net proceeds shall be treated as part of the consolidated revenue of that state. B, where such tax or duty is collected by the government of the federation or other authority of the federation, FRS in this case, there shall be paid to each state at such times as the National Assembly may prescribe a sum equal to the proportion of the net proceeds of such tax or duty that are derived from that state. For all intents and purposes, imposition of duty on documents or transactions by way of stamp duty is on item, on, on item D of part two of the second schedule to the 1999 constitution. What the constitution provides is that stamp duty, stamp duties, though some are collected by the federal government through FIRS, are revenue for the states and not, I emphasize, not revenue for the federal government. My advice to the banks, the, the need for the banks to comply with the clear provisions of the act and stop claiming to be a party to a transaction between two individuals. The banks should stop claiming to be a party to a transaction between two individuals that maintain accounts with them. As doing so will absolutely be in contravention of the clear provisions and the letters of the act. It is very clear that transactions between persons or individuals belongs to the state government and not to the FIRS. Let it be clearly known and understood that by virtue of section 52 and section 53 of the NIPOS Act, the agency is allowed to keep and expend all its revenue and apply them for its own purposes. No COBO coming into NIPOS goes anywhere else, certainly not into the Consolidated Revenue Fund of the states thereby denying the states that are the rightful owners of the stamp of the money from benefiting from it. Suppose it is legitimate for the NIPOST to seek ways of saving the agency from total collapse, it will be unacceptable to natural justice to seek to achieve this goal at the expense of struggling state government that have a legitimate constitutional claim to the process of stamp duties. It must be understood by all relevant authorities that by allowing NIPOST to collect stamp duties on any document evidencing transactions will amount to an act of unjust enrich enrichment at the expense of the citizens of the states from where the duties are derived. In the light of the foregoing, it is our position that NIPOST is an interloper as far as the Stamp Duties Act is concerned. Our professional statement of responsibility. It is therefore our professional opinion and the position that giving powers to NIPOST to collect stamp duties on any transaction whatsoever would amount to robbing the state governments of their legitimate right and will surely lead to constitutional crisis. Stamp duty is a constitutional matter. 
and its implementation should be carried out as provided by both the Act and the Constitution. Collection and distribution of stamp duties revenue are provided for in the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Any implementation of the clear provisions of the Stamp Duties Act, to the contrary, is in total breach of the Constitution and should be stopped and reversed. It is pertinent to note that, to note with regret, that those carrying out the implementation of stamp duties in Nigeria chose to do so without proper reference to the provisions and the letters of the Stamp Duties Act under the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. This is our, this in our opinion, can only happen as a result of two things. One, it is either they adopted to negate and ignore the clear provisions and the letters of the Stamp Duties Act, the, the 1999 Constitution, and to follow their mind on how they believe stamp duties should be implemented. Or two, they do not possess the necessary knowledge and understanding of the provisions and the letters of law and therefore require the necessary training on the subject matter, which can be obtained through CIT and TAS Academy. Notice to the National Assembly and the Minister of Finance. The National Assembly and the Minister of Finance are hereby put on notice that there is great danger should they decide to tinker with the Finance Act 2019 and succeed in conferring on NIPOST with powers to collect stamp duties and the president assents to the amended act. The governors will not hesitate to direct the attorney generals to challenge the obvious constitutional breach without any delay. Thank you very much for listening and God bless you all. Thank you, uh, Ed Albani. That was a very instructive one. And uh, you will agree with me that uh, recommendation here in you, and uh, most of the position pulled out of the first law, including the Supreme and Grand Norm of uh, Law in Nigeria, which is 1999. And then we uh, I, I like to repeat that uh, in your proceedings, in the soft manner that has to amend me. Uh, you, 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 are, you are trying to tell us here that <laughs> they should, they should uh, look at how possible we can move on in doing so. So uh, thank you, uh, Helda Ubani. I know we have, know we have concerns from our um, people. Please, please. Uh, you will be asked some questions which we need your, your uh, uh, let's answer, let's answer, answer as, as possible. As possible. Uh, people have uh, asked people have various ask questions, various and I want you, I want you, I want you to, I want you to please, please uh, note that, note that your your response, response is we can. Uh, 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 number one question, number one question is, is from from uh, Doctor uh, Jerry Kwabai. That, that is asking you to say if the exemption given by the uh, Finance Act 2019 concerning capital market transaction is not in, uh, is not 
something that varies with the, the provision of VAT. I wouldn't know whether you get what I'm trying to say. Uh, VAT and uh, what we have in Finance Act, will you, will, you, will you think the Finance Act has given more exemption on this without considering the provision of the uh, VAT? Well, um, my position when it comes to the Finance Act, the exemptions. Remember the, the 2019 Finance Act uh, is just being implemented. And, uh, and I think as part of it that we are here, that we are here, that we are here. And some of these things are all the recommendations that we will eventually go back to. Uh, to the National Assembly, maybe to the authorities to look at it again. Um, those exemptions, um, for me, I think, especially with regard to Stamp duties. The uh, provisions of the, stamp, the provisions of the uh, of the constitution has to be amended. I am not saying that we are not going to continue with what uh, has happened. The truth of the matter is that issue of stamp duty is a constitutional matter. You possibly amend stamp duties act you will first of all amend the constitution. That is my answer to that. Thank you, uh, Elder Ubani. Uh, you are... Uh, people are just take your time, express yourself, tell us what should be and what it is. What, what it is is that stamp duty clearly is a revenue act. Postage stamp is quite different. I have said it in my paper, and it is the position of the law. Postage stamp is different from the stamp duty stamp. In fact, in November 2019, Anambra State Government launched their own revenue stamp. The, and it is provided for under Section 115. Every governor can make a regulation introducing the kind of stamp they want to use in their state. It is very clear. The truth of the matter is that night post, like I have said, is an interloper as far as stamp duties are concerned. Stamp duties act, implementation of stamp duties act is concerned. Let them face any other thing, but it is rightly given to FIRS, not um, um, uh, night post. Night post don't have any reason to collect stamp duty. In fact, what of the ones they have collected before? Those stamps they had with their way, the people were buying, the postage stamp, people were buying. Which state have they remitted anything to? That is the question. Maybe if we now need to go back, NIPOS, my, NIPOS might even run into trouble because the states are major stakeholders as far as stamp duty is concerned. So if they continue to drag this, they may force the states now go back to ask NIPOS, all the stamps you have sold in my state as using it as stamp duty, where is our own, uh, our, our own part of it? Because all of them, NIPOS has never remitted anything to the states. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Elder. You, you, you will not be able to go now. Uh, you will not be able to, because you just provoke another thought. <laughs>
and the provocation can come in form of anything. So you need to now take charge and expand it more. I want to hold you on this issue of where is our money? Or are you saying the newly constructed panel to recover will not look into that area? You, you can answer that within 20 seconds, sir. Well, in well, the first place, the newly constructed uh, uh, panel or committee, the all intermediate summit committee. committee. Um, um, I am, I am here as an expert, as an expert. in the implementation mm -hmm. of stamp duties. There, no there is no way in, in, in the provisions, provisions of stamp duties that that, 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 that committee provided, provided, provided. It is an illegality. I must tell you the truth. Now, why I say now, so, is that, I said when so is that when it comes to the audit of past years, year, it is provided for in section 24 of the stamp duty and it is the Commission of Stamp Duties that will go and check the records that will go and check the documents that has to do with stamp duties that has to do uh, with stamp duties. Not a ministerial uh, ability. Not a ministerial However, ability. Nigeria, anything However, good. Nigeria, I anything good. good. If for CIT, even the regulator, CIT, regulator of taxation in Nigeria, of taxation in should Nigeria, take charge CIT to should take charge. charge Illegally, that interministerial committee, committee, as far as the face of the law, face of the law is not is not recognized by law. Recognized by law. Are you, by chance, are you trying to say those people that are considered that committee didn't check the provision of constitution and relevant as uh, law before they put that in place? Well, well the, the constitution, or well, well, the first of all, the Act. Is very, very clear. The authority is only the Attorney General of the Federation and the Attorney General of the States. It's very clear. Under Section 111 of the Stamp Duties Act, it says the, 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 the Attorney General of the Federation or Attorney General of the States, they are the only two people that can recover the back, back years. On some oh, it's, only so it's only the commission of stamp duties that can go to check, check the records to call on the what they the, 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 now want the, the, the committee to do. That is the true position of the law. Thank you, Eda Bani. Uh, I'd like to put it to you that you saw in telling us that the, uh, the committee as constituted may not be legal. Uh, Dr. Bak, Mark uh, Abani, please, can you unmute yourself and let's, let's discuss this within 20 seconds. Unmute yourself. Did you listen to your, your friend, your colleague? See me. What, what do you have to say about this? Um, I think that he is, at various times, said that we don't do things that we should do under the Act. Uh, it's very common in this country. In fact, it even relates to the issue of trying to put in a law in tax about making sure that people go to jail if they misspend it. Those rules already exist in this country. There are people already set up to do it, ICPC and all the rest of them. We have our Public Financial Management Act. We have so many things. Laws in Nigeria are ignored at will by those who want to ignore them. So uh, I won't say that his conclusion is wrong. I will say that everybody wants to do something and rather than get down to the bottom of it and fix it, we just create something new. Create something new. Wow. wow. So uh, you're also saying it is not... not... Doctor, you are, I, I'm putting it to you that you are confirming his assertion that the constitution that that committee that may not, not be correct. correct. You have okay, thank you. you. If that is your position, uh, you have, thank you, distinguished participants. You, you agree with me that, that this is not the kind, kind of similar you give me. And those who are registered, they are not here. Uh, uh, well, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what will happen, but if they want uh, a repeat of this, they will have to pay as high as 15,000 Naira to, to, to get a rewind. Uh, so congratulations to those of us that are here, including myself, yours sincerely.
We have our third paper presenter on board, Mr. Howdy uh, Johnson. Mr. Howdy Johnson, you are welcome on the panel. Uh, can, can you unmute yourself and let us start you? Yeah, as quickly as possible. Yeah, as quickly as possible. Miss Audi, please. Miss Audi, I'm trying to unmute you from here so that you can have access. Okay, Hello. Are you there now? Mr. Audio, are you there? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'd like to tell our participants that uh, Mr. Hardu Johnson is an assistant director of tax uh, of uh, micro and small taxpayers of his just places. He has a BSc in business administration from Amadou Bello University, Zaria, 1992, and joined the service of the uh, Federal Revenue Service in 1994. Well, he rose through the rank to the current rank of uh, assistant director of tax uh, around January 2014. He is fully uh, tax person and uh, he's one of the elders in our CITN with membership number 4497. How you please your time that starts now? Okay. Uh, my topic is already on display, stamp duty administration in Nigeria. Stamp duty is simply a tax on commercial and legal documents. Am I too fast? I say stamp duty is simply a tax on commercial and legal documents. Huh? Which record are you related to certain transactions? So because of that instrument not properly stamped out admissible in court in the court of law, and penalties are charged for late stamping according to the provisions of the stamp duty act X8 LFA and the Federal Inland Revenue Establishment of 2011. These are the two principal acts for the administration of stand duty in Nigeria. Section 23 of the act, which provides that all instruments chargeable with stamp duty, are to be stamped within 40 days from the first execution day of upon payment of the duty or unpaid except otherwise provided by the law. Failure to stamp the instrument within the prescribed period attracts a penalty to be a penalty. Sorry, I... However, such instrument is admissible in, in, in criminal proceeding. Where they are, I think it's only in civil proceeding that they may not be admissible, notwithstanding any duty or paid or not. It may also be tendered to prove a fraud or out of bankruptcy. Those are exceptional cases. 
In the same way, a receipt that is not due, uh, duty stamp may be admitted in proceedings or before any arbitrator or referee in the court. Referee or the, is satisfied that the failure to stamp the receipt is due to the ignorance or illiteracy, illiterate person tendering the receipt. So the next I this is definition of commonly used terms in stamp duties. Stamp is defined to include a stamp impressed by means of a die as ad adhesive denoting any duty or fee. Duty has been defined as any stamp duty for the time being chargeable under the, under the act or any other law and also inclusive any fee chargeable there, in, there under. Instrument is defined to include any written document. Execution is defined as when a written document under seal is signed by both parties. Denoting this term is used when the dice are impressed, fixed or adhesive on any document indicating any duty page. Embossment is stamping of any document known as instrument by the use of stamping machine. Die includes any plate, tool, or implement, whatever used under the direction of the minister or his counterpart in the state, as the case may be, for expressing or denoting any duty or rate of duty. Adjudication, the power of the commissioner to adjudicate is premised on section 16 of the act, which provides that the commissioner, the commissioner on the request of any person express, can express an opinion with reference to amount of duty payable on any executed instrument. The legal framework of stamp duties. The stamp duty Act Cap S H laws of the Federation 2004 as its origin from the English laws imposed in the on the country during the colonial era. The law was promulgated in 1939 and was variously amended in between 1942 to 2004. Our most recent amendment is uh, the is in the Finance Act of 2019. Stamp duties come under the exclusive legislative list in the Constitution. This implies that only the federal government is competent to legislate on the matter. This makes it solely the duty of Federal Inland Revenue Service, as the, only the competent authority to collect and account for such tax. Jurisdiction of stamp duty. The law has made a distinction between the duties charged by the federal government and those chargeable by state governments. The federal government is the only competent authority to impose, charge, or collect duties upon instru instruments between a company and an individual, group, or individuals. State government charge or collect duties in respect of instruments executed between persons or individuals. However, the rate of duties chargeable by the state has to be agreed with the federal government. This is contained in section four of the act. Commissioner of stamp duties and functions. Stamp duty is managed by the commissioner for stamp duty who are appointed by the Civil Service Commission of the Federation or of a state as provided in section six of the act. In appointing the commissioner, the law empowers the president or the governor as the case may be to limit the powers of such commissioner to adjudication only. 
The commissioner of stamp duty is the administrative head of the stamp duty, responsible for assessing instrument and imposing penalty where necessary. The commissioner is also responsible for stamping and enforcing the instrument with stamp and keeps custody of the stamping instrument, such as die and adhesive stamp. Right, well, before I go to the, the, the next uh, slide, forms of stamp duty, I want to emphasize that the president, uh, the Federal Civil Service or the president has delegated the powers of appointment to the management or chairman of Federal Inland Revenue in appointing commissioners on the federal level. While the state, uh, uh, the chairman of the internal revenue boards are responsible for appointment of uh, commissioners for stamp duties. Although the actor, the president, There are basically three forms of uh, stamp duties. Those fixed duties, these are duties that do not vary with the amount consideration. This means that the value taking, the value is not taken into consideration while assessing. Example of instrument assessed with fixed duties include check leaves, admission as solicitor or notary public, guarantors form, and prosy forms. At Valerian duties, these are duties that vary with the amount of consideration in accordance with the relevant schedule fixed by government. Example of instrument with Valerian duty assessment are tenancy and lease agreement, policy of life insurance, deed of assignment, bill of sale, vending agreement, shares of companies. While the third one are those exempted, exempted instrument. This list of exempted instruments include the following. Admission as a military advocate or declaration made for the purpose of being filed in any court in Nigeria or before any judge or court. Agreement or memorandum for hire of any laborer. All instruments on which the duty will be paid by government. All documents relating to transfer of stock or shares. These are exempted from duty payments. For want of, want of time, I want to skip this because it's elaborate. I wouldn't take it one after the other, but it's there on the slide. I've already mentioned a few of them. The duties that have a fixed rate and duties that have varying rates. These are already mentioned briefly, but they are here in detail. So I'll skip it for want of time. Between 2010 and uh, this slide is showing the projection of collection of stamp duty by FRS. Between 2010 and 2019, it's there for us to see. And the source is FRS web portal collection so far in January 2020 to June 2029. 2020, sorry. So it is to be noted that the sharp increase noticed in 2020 collection so far is as a result of remittances of over 20 billion by money deposit banks and 39 billion by the Central Bank of Nigeria, all remitted backlog duties. So I now come to Finance Act and the current development as it relates to stamp duty. The Finance Act 2019 section 52 to 56, which was passed into law in December 2019 and took effect in February 2020, amend the following sections of the Stamp Duty Act. 
S8 of uh, Law of Federation 2004. Section 52 of the Finance Act amends Section 2 of the Stamp Duty Act by substituting the word stamp, stamp and instrument to include electronic document and legalizing electronic transactions. Section 53 of the Finance Act amends Section 4 of the Stamp Duty Act as follows. In subsection one, by substituting the words, the federal government in line one to federal inland revenue service. And in subsection two, by substituting the word, the state government in line one to the uh, relevant or competent or relevant authority in the state. Section 54 of the finance are substituted substitute for section 89 of the stand duty act by imposing a duty on electronic receipt, electronic transfer of money deposit in any bank or with any banker in an account to be accounted for and expressed to be received of the sum to whom the same is uh, amount of 10,000 or pressure attract a singular and one off duty of 15 Provided that money paid into one's account one's own account or transfer electronically between accounts owned by the, by the owner within the same bank shall not be chargeable to duty. That's an exemption to the payment of 15 Naira on the, the bank transaction of 10,000 Naira and above. Section 55 of the Finance Act, the list section 90 of the Stamp Duty Act, certain form of tip not Section 56 of the amend the schedule to stamp duties. In starting under the category of exempted receipt, a new item receipt given by any le regulated security lending transaction carried out under regulation issued by the Stock Exchange Commission. In starting under the category of general exemption from stamp duty, new item 14, 15, and 16. 14, shares stock or security transferred by a lender or is approved borrower in furtherance of a regulated security lending transactions. 15, shares stock or security return to a lender or is approved on a pursuance to a regulated security lending transactions. All documents relating to a regulated security lending transactions So implication of the amendment on the, on the stamp duty act. East stamp in section 52 of the finance act has successfully provided the much needed legal legitimacy for the practice of electronic stamping done by FRS via the web portal, via the portal www.stampduty.government.org. Two, one of the major implication of the amendment is that the FRS slash NACO's contention, section 53 of the Finance Act has brought the lingering jurisdiction contention to rest by recognizing FRS as the only competent government agency to impose charge and collect stamp duty upon instrument specifying the schedule to the stamp duty. It is important to also understand that postage stamp as administered by NAPOS is for the purpose of uh, delivery of items and documents. It does not denote duty and therefore is hence for not substituted for FRS and HC stamp. Stamp duties on electronic transfer section 52 of the Finance Act has charged Imposition of 15 era stamp duty and electronic transfer from upward up 10,000 upward. Section 54 of the finances has legalized and legitimized data to 15 era stamp duty charged by money deposit bank on behalf of federal government. This development has led to the remittance of backlog stamp duty by money deposit bank of about 20 billion 
and, and Central Bank of Nigeria 39 billion, totally about 60 billion. And is the this is the premise upon which the uh, inaugural ministerial committee on audit and recovery of back here stamp duty is uh, through the federal. Uh, In view of the foregoing, the executive chairman of Federal Inland Revenue, Abdi Muhammad M. Nami, has projected to collect over 500 billion as stamp duty. Oh, okay, uh, I think we're having issues with uh, the network. While we are doing that, I quickly want to put forward some questions. And uh, uh, some of our panelists will help us to answer that. Uh, there's this question from Tumbosu or Dukoya. Is asking who should handle stamp duty on deed of assessment, deed of assignments. Is it FRS or states? And I'd like Dr. Abani to please answer that. Dr. Abani, please. Tubozo is asking who should handle stamp duty on deed of assignment. Is it federal or state counterparts? Thank you. Thank you. I think um, all of these follow pari passu with the separation in the law, uh, that once it's involved in that transaction, then FIRS is the person who will be responsible for that. If, however, it's individual to individual, then the state is the one that will come into that. I think at the very simplest level, that is uh, the answer to that question. Uh, uh, Dr. Abani, I have a feel that your friend has contrary opinion. Can, can, maybe I should just allow him to talk as well so that we now come back to you. Uh, Elder Chi Ubani, do, do you have anything to say about that? Please unmute yourself. Unmute yourself and talk to us. Unmute yourself and talk to us. Unmute yourself and talk to us. Yes. 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 In the first place, federal government does not have any land. Hold on, Chief Ubani. Let us put you very well so that we can get it clearly. Okay, so you can continue now. Okay. The, the truth of the matter is that all lands belong to states. When it comes to deed of assignment, it has to be a state. Even where federal government has uh, either a building or anything in a state, the state government has to assign them and allocate the property to them, the land to them. No land belongs to the federal government unless FCT. So when it comes to deal of assignment, it has to be the state. Okay. Uh... Chief Ubani, I also want to take you up. I, my little understanding of land law, we have something called, uh, is it rural land or there about local government and then the same one for state government? Will your answer remain the same? If this land happened to be in my village where I can local government is the 
uh, jurisdiction uh, local government is in charge of this. Uh, local government is under a state. <laughs> now, deed of assignment that has to do that one that is that did that deed of assignment, the local government land is not uh, uh, covered by certificate of occupancy. Rather, it is covered by. Um, Hello. Uh, there's a, there's a name for it, uh, but the truth of the matter is that when it comes to certificate of occupancy, you are signing it to another person. It's either the, so they are on the local government one is called customary right of occupancy. Now, if it is a deed of assignment under customary right of occupancy, it has to be the local government. But if it is under certificate of occupancy, it has to be the state. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Abani, I'm not going to ask you that question any longer. Rather, I will, Dr. You, you, you are saying something. Yes, I, I, while I understand fully where my learned colleague is coming from. Um, Imagine two learned colleagues. That is uh, based on the, on the sale and so on of the land. So all of the of land. Land, in respect of the land would, would be for the state. However, we're talking of stamping an instrument. And if that instrument is between, involves a company, then I still think the Federal Inland Revenue Service will stick their nose into it. Do, do, Dr. Abani, he has agreed to your uh, further <laughs> explanation. But right. don't, don't just be happy and go, because I have another question for you. What is the penalty for non-permitters of stamp duty? What do you think it should be? See, let's leave the... Uh, Ratmataza or what everybody is trying to flex in, in terms of their uh, powers according to law. What do you say to our audience, the penalty for non-remittance? Well, there, there are two things here. First of all, we, have, we always talk about and we try to justify that it's a disability in a court of law. The majority of agreements never get near a court of law. Is supposed to be paid uh, within a certain number of days of the transaction, the standardable transaction. So it doesn't matter whether it's going to go to court later or not. That should be done. It, the, the provisions about the courts, I think section 23 or 47, one of those ones, about those late penalties and those late charges, courts, is to try and make it. Public that you should have already uh, and providing for late payment of those uh, uh, revenues in those circumstances. Thank you. Now, in, in terms of penalties, the, the FIRS Act, having subsumed some of the penalties that are within the law, arguably their own penalties will apply. But really, we need to go back to basics we must address the stamp duty law itself and provide the correct types of penalties that are commensurate with the offenses. Uh, that is the real answer to the question. The, um, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll come back to you very soon. Uh, Mr. Audrey Johnson, I know you are available. Can, can you just continue where you stop and you have uh, three minutes to round up, sir? Mr. Audi Johnson, are you there? Mr. Audi Johnson. Okay, why is trying to um, resolve his uh, network issue. Uh, the, there's a question here, and I want us to get it first, then I'll call on one of our panelists to do justice to that. What is the meaning of uh, extra charge on stamp duty, especially with regard to the press release by uh, FRS recently? How does it work? Um, I'd like Dr. Abbott to help us with that. 
The, is this in relation to the just released uh, Federal Inland Revenue Schedule? Unmute um, yourself, Dr. Abanu. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, if this question is in relation to the just released uh, FIRS guidance, which goes down to give uh, the rates for all the different, I think it's about six or seven long. Uh, and there's a whole column there that refers to extra copies or extra charges. I think that's exactly what it is, extra copies. So if you want numerous copies, it's a flat 50 Naira for those uh, numerous uh, additional copies. I'm not sure what other thing we're referring to in respect of extra charges. I hope that's... Yes, that, yes. yes. that should su suffice. I want us to continue. Uh, is uh, Mr. Aldo there? Otherwise, we move on. Mr. Aldo, please unmute yourself and uh, come on board. Okay, while we're doing that, uh, can uh, Dr. Oladele Rotimi come on board? Dr. Oladele Rotimi, please come back if you are there. Why Dr. Uh, Mr. Adu is uh, resolving his uh, network issue? Okay, so uh, why we are coming on board? Okay, uh, Ms. Alvin, you are back, so talk to us, please. We can understand how network will behave. Please just, just come back and uh, let's have more from your side. We notice you are trying to share your screen. Miss Aldu? Okay. Miss Aldu? Okay, uh, if we are not getting him, I uh, can confirm to us that that should do for, for a seminar. We will now go to uh other question that may come from uh participants so if you have a specific question and you want specific uh paper presenter to attend to can you just quickly drop it on the question and answer a session of the zoom platform we we've noted most of the question asked so far we have about uh 60 questions and we've been able to match them uh, and that will be fine. Okay, so in, in, in conclusion, because of our network and our, our time, I, I like past president, MSDK, to please, in, in, in a kind of five minutes or three minutes thereabouts, touch on all the paper presented so far, and also talk on your opinion as regards what agitation of our members and public is as touches stamp duty. MSDK, please unmute yourself, sir. Thank you very much, uh, moderator Professor Yodoku. Um, I think it has been uh, quite very enlightening and educative, you know, uh, session we had. Uh, Dr. Bani, as always, um, had a very paradigmatic uh, 
you know, presentation. Uh, quite a, quite insightful, quite ins incisive. Uh, of course, um, he posed quite a, a lot of questions. Uh, like, you know, no, come on saying, the taste of the pudding is in the eating. You can never get it all when you are drafting or couching any particular legislation or any particular draft. So uh, when you finish, even, even you as a person who drafted can still criticize. And that is what I think is the whole benefit of um, having uh, this particular um, seminar. Um, Chief Obani, who has all been, has been so much passionate on the Stand Beauties uh, Act. Of course, they've very, very deeply uh, on the issue. I've had the benefit of um, reading some of his writings on uh, Stand Beauties. And uh, Mr. Audu has equally done um, uh, good justice. Listen very, attentively even to interventions made by Ms. Albert Florence Shaw and Dr. Titi Foroko. A lot of questions have been posed. And I think uh, quite seriously speaking, um, we still need to, uh, now that um, people are trying to see Stan Bridges as a cash cow for Nigerian tax system, still go back uh, to what I consider the work in progress uh, with regards to the boundaries for stand duties beyond the issues that have been raised today. Uh, the tussle between uh, FRS and the uh, nine posts, and then the issue of uh, FRS and the states is also very critical. But I think I also need to also look at um, the issue about uh, stand duties and VAT. Okay and uh, make sure that um, we don't create situations of double taxation. Um, we want, we want um, tax revenue collection to be enhanced. More revenue is needed, but then uh, equally to, but not at all cost, you know, impoverishing the citizens and creating more problems in the society. Uh, when the issues have been looked at, for instance, um, uh, an individual, uh, carrying that, uh, you know, when you have a um, uh, one to one transaction, but we're not talking about multiplicity of the transactions, paying across the counter, paying through a uh, mobile transfer, paying, um, you know, through another entity, then you're not talking about um, layers and layers of stand duties. Should it be one off or should it be multiple, you know, permits? So those are critical issues that we need to be, you know, addressing. Like it's always said, the taste of the pudding is in the eating. You can never get all the scenarios, you know, right until we start implementing. I think that is uh, my takeaway from this session. Um, see work in progress and what's uh, done in order to bring the whole issue uh, to a, a better and manageable you know, uh, state going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, my past president, uh, CBK. We will continue to uh, talk to you. We will continue to have you around and uh, your wealth of experience is what we need and we're sure you are always there for us. Um, the single participants, been great people. However, I want to tell you that uh, Mr. Ogiri Zubara is right there in the audience and is now uh, brought forward to our uh, panelist side. And Ogiri Zubara is the executive chairman of Lagos in our, uh, our revenue. And then uh, we have uh, Mr. Tulu Adegye of Ondo State uh, counterpart. The two of them will talk to us, even if I have not told them before that they will be speaking to us. Or move yourself and talk to us. If you want us to see your face, we will be very happy. Mr. Tolu Adebe of uh, Ojo State's uh, Board of Internal Revenue. 
Miss Atulu. Miss Atulu Adigbe, Executive Chairman of uh, those states, Internal Revenue Service. Okay, uh, can we have uh, Mr. Yodil Zubar, please? Please unmute yourself and talk to yourself. Okay, thank you, sir. We see that you're coming up. We may, we may wish to see your face, if possible, sir. Good afternoon. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Talk to us generally. Talk to us generally on the subject of uh, discussion. Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Well, on this, uh, this stamp duties issue is getting uh, to be a bit, a bit controversial. Now from the States, our perspective is that we do not know why using technology that is available to us, why the stamp duties charged and collected cannot be remitted directly to the States. That's one major issue for consideration. I'm sorry, I, I, I logged in very late, so I do not know the trend of this uh, conversation. But from my own perspective, we at the state level feel that rather than channel it through FIRS, the possibility of channeling it directly to the states based on derivation. Because we feel that if it is sent as it is presently to the Federation account is going to be treated as FAC. And that has two implications for the state. If it's treated as FAC, then it's not going to be taken as IGR. So we are at the state level, we have a problem with that because stamp duties is clearly a, a, a tax, you know, that should be part of an IGR. So that's one and normally it will create. Secondly, we feel that stamp duties should be distributed on the basis of derivation. What I mean by that is where the individuals, the states that the individuals reside in should be the beneficiary of the stamp duty that is collected. We cannot treat it like VAT where um, certain formulae that is that is not too clear that we states do not believe in is being applied. You know, Lagos State has always challenged a lot of uh, things that are done at the federal level, um, not just based on, on having our, our resources, but you know, on the principle of equity and fairness. If somebody lives, for instance, in Ondo State and electronically the bank has charged him some stamp duty, there's no reason why Mr. Digby should not be the recipient of that uh, uh, stamp, stamp duty. Why should it go? And then people from, with all respect, Aqua Ibom, who know nothing about the transaction, get benefit of the transaction. So we, we feel that um, CITN, as a, as a major influencer of taxation policies in the Federation, should do more along with the joint tax board that we all belong to. So our own issues are one, accountability, i.e. the banks accounting to us directly for what they have uh, uh, um, charged. And secondly, distribution, not to FAC, but distribution directly to the states based on derivation. The addresses as tendered, I'm talking of electronic, uh, uh, um, charge right now. So based on where the individual has put as his address of residence, that is what should be applied. If the individual wants to change his address, he's at liberty to change his address. If he moves to Ondo State, for instance, or to Jigawa State, there's no reason why it should not be charged, you know, and distributed to Jigawa State or, or Ondo State. So I think these are my uh, major contributions, along with the other lines that 
a lot of the, the provisions of the act are actually obsolete and should be brought, brought uh, to, to, to meet the economic realities that we face right now. So I'm sorry, this is very impromptu. I didn't even know I was going to, I was going to say anything at all <laughs> from, the top of, from the top of my head. <laughs> I, I, I was actually told that you were once a Boy Scout and you have your motor, which is be prepared. And that's why you, you have this position. Uh, without sounding bored, uh, we want to appreciate what you just said. Now, you provoke another thought now by saying the provisions of this so-called art is obsolete. But you agree with me that recently we have just a um, um, little amendment. So you are trying to tell us now that holistic amendment you should actually happen. Uh, yes. What is your effort among your colleagues in JTB to ensure this provision is brought on board? Because you, I read about the function of JTB, and you guys have a lot to do. What's your effort about that, sir? Yes, um, incidentally, we discussed the issues of um, stamp duties recently at a technical and appraisal committee level. And um, we, several states brought their own position on possible amendments to the act. So JTB is working on it. We, we, we are presently compiling all the suggested amendments, which we will then distill and forward to the appropriate uh, uh, authorities, being the National Assembly, of these suggestions. So JTB is working on it. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yes, I'm on. I'm still here. Okay, so um, I, I have a chat here saying your your discussion with us is very uh, apt. That uh, the fear is that uh, when it comes to amendment of tax law and constitution, is always a rigid one. Uh, we want to pray that uh, you and your colleagues over there will do more in order to achieve this. Thank you so much for being part of this game, and uh, we believe you will continue to support the cause of CIT in ensuring that we are able to get across to uh, a stakeholder which government is uh, inclusive. Thank you so much, sir. I want to bring on board the uh, man of uh, Ondo State Board of Internal Revenue, uh, Mr. Tolu Adegbe. I, I saw him around. If we see on, we'd like to see him now. Is he on? Okay, uh, Mr. Tolu, please unmute yourself and come on board. Talk to your people. Uh, let's, let's hear from your side. It's not there. Good morning. Good morning, all. Uh, to all the participants, good morning. To my chairman, <laughs> Mr. Yosuba, <laughs> actually, the chairman of the JTB, our president and technical committee. Um, we were discussing staff duty at the whole of last week. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Dr. Mark Bani, and all the uh, participants. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, CITN for organizing this. Honestly, this has been very insightful. I have um, 10 of my colleagues um, listening in, uh, joining, and I've been asking them, phoning them internally, and um, I believe they've learned a lot. Uh, we have recently upgraded our stamp duty offices, um, and all the people involved have joined in. So um, in terms of content, this has been very rich. Uh, even at chairman's level, I've learned one or two things, you know, from, from the eminent resource people that um, CI10 has brought in. Um, I really have nothing to add, but to say that um, uh, thanks to CI10 for this. 
And um, from the perspective of an administrator or tax administrator in the state, I believe uh, Mr. Subai has um, uh, enunciated our own concerns. Because we have these concerns about the way stamp duty is going to be um, administered. For example, when FRS released their FAQ um, last week, they said it is only FRS that will be collecting electronic stamp duty. I mean, where is that in the act? I mean, clearly FRS is trying to usurp a, 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 a usurp powers that they don't have. So already they are creating some form of um, uh, unease between us and them, but JTB will resolve all of that. Uh, so they cannot say we are not, the law is very clear about which stamp duty comes to which arm of government, whether it's electronic or not electronic. I mean, the law did not specify that. So um, we'll, we'll take that up with um, FRS. But in terms of the law and everything, I think, this, this panel, the panelists we have today, they really, 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 really taught a lot of the younger ones what stamp duty is all about. And the enlightenment they brought uh, will help, help, help in our jobs. Thank you very much. Thank you, my chairman. Uh, yours is a, a kind of a, how do I put it? You, you've corroborated your colleagues. I, I don't expect you to go against your collective agreement. And uh, if you people can come together, you do more than expect. Thank you, my chairman, for that. Uh, I don't think you permitted to go and eat now. You just go so random so that you get other comments from other uh, panelists as we are rounding up now. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, please, can you just um, help us attend to this? Why you submit with your final thoughts? Uh, Taiwo is asking for more clarification on penalty for failure to remit stamp duties. I, I, I know Dr. Abani has uh, touched on that. The following show, please. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. I'm saying that uh, one of our participants is asking for more clear education with regards to the penalty for non remittance of uh, stamp duties. When you are trying to do that, I need you to please close with your closing thoughts. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you once again for bringing me on. Uh, the, like I said, in Section 12 of the Stamp Duties Act, you make this a uh, compulsory that um, instruments are to be stamped at the time of execution, okay? So that is the, the provision that actually make it compulsory. We all, we all had the idea or the knowledge that, oh, the only reason why we stamp uh, instruments is because or to make it uh, admissible in a court of law. It is not only when, and, uh, and then a lot of people have also said that if I don't relate, if I believe that this transaction will not lead to litigation, why should I stamp? Is it even compulsory? So I don't need to stamp or uh, I have borrowed somebody money, the person has paid. So there are no disproofs, but the law make it clear that, I mean, an instrument should be stamped before the first execution. And so if you go to section 23, it says that where you fail to stamp, okay, um, if it is an ad valorem duty, uh, you pay um, within 30 days for ad valorem and then within 40 days for fixed duty or vice versa. I'm just trying to check that. Okay, the penalty that is payable as per stamp duties act is 10%. Okay, 10% of course, and then interest um, and an amount of interest which is equal to the unpaid duty. So the amount of interest you pay should not be more than the unpaid duty. That is in section 23. But like I said earlier that those uh, penalties and uh, of 20 naira here and there may have become obsolete. And I can see uh, FRS uh, trying to trigger the provision of the FRS Establishment Act to say that uh, since uh, the stamp duty is one of the taxes that are to be administered by them, they can invoke the provision 
of the FRS Establishment Act to charge 10% penalty plus interest at the rolling rate, which is provided in the FRS um, Establishment Act. That is, the, that is the provision, okay? But of course, like uh, Dr. Abani said, can the penalty be more than the, even the value carried by the instrument? Those are also issues. A lot of people have also, on my final thought now, a lot of people have questioned the rates of um, term duty when it comes to lease or rent. Okay, the law is very clear. FRS has published 6%, but we know that it depends on the duration of the, of the tenancy. For zero to uh, seven years, it's supposed to be 0.78%. Uh, from seven to 21 years, the stamp duty rate is 3%. And it is only where the tenor is above six, uh, 21 years that the 6% uh, quoted in the FRS uh, publication should apply. I think we need to uh, bring that into perspective. Like the chairman has spoken, uh, I believe that the focus, of, the focus will be more on how to amend this obsolete uh, provision. Because uh, like we said, it was a 1939 law. And in terms of relevant authority, that needs to be addressed. As far as the law is concerned today, it is very clear that where there is transaction between an individual and a company, the FRS has the responsibility to collect. And that is why the FRS have said that anything that is electronic, they know that in terms of this transfer, it relates to a, a, a bank that is making the transfer. You cannot remove the bank and, uh, and focus on the two individuals. I'm talking about where the transaction is between two individuals and begin to look at the, the transferee and the transferor with, and then excluding the bank. You cannot exclude the bank. And that also has to be addressed. I believe that the chairman will also work with JTB so that all these um, amendments can be made. And of course, we're also, uh, also appealing that um, uh, the audit that's... Um, uh, the back duty that is being focused by the FRS, uh, we believe that even though it is provided for in section 114, the back duty can be, take, uh, can be carried out for five years. I mean, yes, for five years. So um, we believe that you should know the provision of the law before embarking on the enforcement. But of course, the law has been there. So uh, we believe that all of this will let us, I mean, make a lot of people understand uh, the provision of stamp duty. I said, I sent in a question which I intended that people should also understand. And that one has to do with um, um, where you have a, a loan by a Nigerian bank from a, a foreign uh, lender, all those multilateral institu institution. Okay, it depends, the provision says that it depends on who is taking the security. So where such loan is backed up by security, it means it is the lender that is taking the security and it is that lender that will be required to pay stamp duty. But if there is no security, then it is the borrower. So which means it depends on who is taking the security and whether this, the, the, the loan is backed up by a, by a security or not, or just an ordinary loan that is unsecured. Okay, so if you have engaged with the stamp duties commissioners, you will uh, get familiar with most of these things. Thank you very much. It's a very good, um, interesting session, and I've enjoyed it. Thank you to the chairman that came on board and our senior ones. We, uh, we are grateful. A lot of our young people to have uh, learned. We hope that they will continue, even after this session, to have themselves in groups and discuss most, most of these things. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. And uh, I like the part where you said, uh, Young ones like me should come together and uh, we should start discussing. Uh, when we do that, and we'll see what certain can do to bring this, my set of eaglets together uh, in order to achieve that. Uh, while I'm thanking you, I'd like to quickly call on Titi for Ocon. Dr. Titi for Ocon, your final thought on this, and you take this question, which is the final question I have for today. Uh, if any other question comes, we'll treat it next time. Uh, Olushola Bamigoye. Is saying, can a third party check of 10,000 error above uh, that has been deposited be liable to stamp duty of 15 error? And it's trying to remind us that don't forget that this check has suffered stamp duty before. Uh, Titi, for welcome. You are, you are on board. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Edekun, for anchoring this program. Thank you also to those who have uh, spoken ahead and contributed. 
I will start from that question. As it is today, based on the interpretation of the act by the bankers, uh, once it's above 10,000, once you pay a deposit into your account, you see the 50 Naira. When you go into your statement, you see that 50 Naira coming. Now, we also need to know the different transactions. This is why it was said that there's so, many conf so much confusion around this stamp duty. And if you're not careful, the implementation will, get, will be messed up or create more problems than envisaged by the government and by the uh, um, FRS and Minister of Finance when this came up. So as, at, as it is today, once you lodge in a check and it's above that amount, you see a 50 Naira that comes into your account as stamp duty. Whether we, we can now start saying whether that should be or not, but that's what the law says as of now because of the amount involved. Um, then, um, but be as it may, we still have a long way to go on this issue of um, transfer, um, sorry, stamp duty in terms of the implementation of the Finance Act as it is. Uh, FRS will interpret the law to support uh, their own gener revenue generation. The states will also interpret it to support their own side of it. The taxpayer will also interpret to support his own side of it. So it will always be on and on and on until when all of us can have an amicable way to resolve this. Now, on a, on a final note and for party note for me, I want to also mention the angle of transfer pricing because we seem to talk about stamp duty, stamp duty, stamp duty, and forget the fact that even these documents we are talking about happens between related companies. There are quite a lot of companies that have so many agreements that they've done between themselves that will come within the purview of transfer pricing, and this is a time for them to now look at the implications of this, especially when they are talking of um, um, millions of dollars of, of transactions, and then you have to pay percentage of it as stamp duty. This is also an area of concern uh, that most um, um, related party will have to now look at uh, when it comes to the stamp duty. Uh, so MNEs will have to start to look at um, their transactions, look at the implication. Now, coming to the audit, the back duty assessment, I, I see um, stakeholders um, pushing back a bit. Let me not say a bit, they're pu pushing back because of the implication, because of the, uh, the, 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 the way we keep record in Nigeria before now. It's when transfer pricing came, we started having all this documentation and then people are conscious about transactions. But when it comes to this issue of stamp duty, we know the implication of it. Um, People that don't have good records will suffer a lot, and we know what comes out of uh, back duty assessment. So, like um, um, Mr. Folonsho said, this is an area that um, we believe that will be looked into: uh, the impact on the on the on the on the companies, the impact on the taxpayer, and the likely effect on business doing business within the country. So, this is necessary for to be looked into. Overall, I want to say thank you to everybody that participated in this um, webinar. Thank you for our chairman. Uh, I always call the Lagos State Chairman my chairman because I'm a full water than breaded in Lagos. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for Ugo State Chairman, uh, Ugo State Chairman. And I want to appreciate all our different paper presenters for the job done. I believe that this has stirred up thoughts in the mind of so many people about the stamp duty, about stamp duty in Nigeria, the application of the act, the implementation. And like was said, um, I will join Professor to say, that I'm one of the millennium age. So we start thinking of what to do so that our own generation would make a difference uh, when it comes to this stamp duty and other matters. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Titi, for all. I, I want to really take you up. Which one is millennium again? I'll take you almost 60. I beg you. <laughs> please, 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 please. Let us know our, our, our age. Life begins at 50. So we are just starting life. <laughs> no problem. Actually, I actually was discussing with the president here that I would have resigned from my position today if you had not mentioned transfer pricing. I know you love that. And as at the time I was saying so, you brought that in. Well, I pity your role in, within this style of uh, transfer pricing. Thank you for your thoughts and I really appreciate you. Now, in order to close for today, I'd like to bring on board uh, my boss. I uh, used to call him boss of bosses, a person of uh, the vice president of our dear institute, uh, Mr. Additional Isaac Adedayo. We call him brother Isaac and Oracle of our time. Uh, we, we bring him on board now to talk to us 
and uh, appreciate all our paper presenter only. Titi was trying to do so. And that's uh, our vice president, vice president, sir, you are board. Thank you, uh, thank you, chairman of the education committee, uh, Professor Godwin Oyedoko. Let me start first by appreciating the president and council of the CIT, because if the president has said no, we may not be talking about this uh, webinar today. So, my president, man. We appreciate you and thank you for giving us this opportunity. Now, the chairman of the education committee and his committee members, including the members of staff, they had to make this happen almost like in less than a week or two. And that is why I have to say I appreciate Professor Godwin Oyedoko, who is only doubled as the moderator for this uh, uh, webinar. Thank you so much, Prof. You are always on call whenever duty says you should show yourself. I want to start with uh, Dr. Makabani in no set order. Uh, Dr. Abani, we can never appreciate you enough. I was struggling to actually look at your new look because I knew how you look like before COVID-19. But when I saw this one, I said, well, this one is even looking better than the one before that period. We appreciate you always. And as our coordinating dean, we look forward to more of this uh, thoughts inspiring and action provoking uh, discussion. She, uh, uh, Uzoma Francis Ubani, that's one man that is passionate about stamp duty and everything that has to do with tax. We've seen you in action, we've seen you as a consultant, and today you've been able to show that this is your terrain. We want to say thank you so much too for giving us this honor. Mr. How do Ola Johnson? Even with the network trying not to cooperate with you, you were still able to pass the message across. We appreciate you for honoring this too. Thank you so much. Now, at the level of uh, our friends and uh, past president, especially Chief MACDK, a past president of the Institute and a former director of past policy, Whenever he talks, we are always uh, enlightened more about his, based on his depth of experience. Uh, my past president, sir, thank you so much for giving us your insight to this. Then we have um, our home pastor and uh, Pedabo himself, Abbas Falonsha. Somebody that whenever also talking to, you know that he has taken his time to do his research. And when he keeps raising one or two issues, you will know that, yes, this is coming from his depth of knowledge. Thank you for giving us your perspective, too. Dr. Titilayo for Walker, emergency millennial. <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> How can somebody in that my bracket be calling herself millennial? Well, I don't know about that. All I can say is that I said you are doing some transfer pricing on the other side. <laughs> you belong to this side. Thank you for adding your perspective to this too. We appreciate you. Now, um, our governor, I will say, uh, our chairman, Lagos Inner Revenue Service. You were well, you always supposed a lot, but today you are not really saying so much because of the fact that you want a situation that addresses any stamp duty collected from Lagos, transferred to Lagos. So we appreciate you for giving us that your perspective, and I can assure you, as an institute that is meant to regulate us in all its ramifications, all the issues will always come again, and I can assure this discussion will always continue. The share on the internal revenue service, I like your mode of presentation, especially when you made it very clear that FRS should stay where it belongs. They should maintain their lane. And uh, when you made that position, you were very emphatic. That has been noted, and we also appreciate your contribution to that. And beyond this, I also want to appreciate the over 400 participants. On Zoom, 
and not even counting those who are also watching again at the YouTube level. <laughs> Honestly, if you decide to go through the who is who on those Zoom, I can assure you that so many people will need to be recognized and give my thank you message. All I can say again is that thank you so much. And on a final note, I want to tell you that this discussion will continue. Thank you and God bless you. Okay, uh, that was a uh, vice president of our uh, institute. We also thank him for thanking all our panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, Chairman Ayodele Zubar, we saw your comment and the uh, president acknowledged. Thank you so much for that. Why would we be expecting uh, Madam Aisha Ribadu to get ready to appreciate the CITN formally? Uh, we'll quickly run through a few of our upcoming events and we would like you to please stay with us. Do not go. That is the only thing we need from you to, uh, uh, to round up. Uh, Madam Aisha Ribadu, please get ready. Just unmute yourself now. Aisha Ribadu works with uh, JTV and uh, she has always loved to be wherever we are discussing transition. Please uh, get ready to give vote of thanks to CITN for this. Uh, CITN will be having a series of our uh, MPTP this time around via our uh, webinar. And uh, you will see that Enugun is slated for 13th of August. Enugun 13th of August. Uyo is 20th of August. Oweri is uh, 24th. And uh, the issue of uh, Anatas conference for now postponed, but it will come uh, as soon as the committee is ready for us. Uh, we also have other uh, program that, uh, especially beneath the uh, 6th of August, uh, we have various courses with our uh, TAS Academy. Please, if you think you need a specific knowledge in a specific area of a transition, talk to uh, uh, Professor Abrazak uh, uh, led team in discussing that, they, will, they can customize that for you and you will appreciate that. There are lots to learn uh, in, in arena of uh, uh, transition. Like I said, new dates for our annual trans conference will be announced soon. And the academic conference we go in the next one or two months, we will come back to all our members and then we shall inform you of the dates. This time around, council has approved that uh, Uh, we also do it in the two months and uh, through webinar. So if you subscribe, uh, you, you will be able to do that. Then I want to tell us that you should tell our people who are interested in our examination that uh, registration is ongoing and uh, you are not a member of CITN even when you are holding the certificate, but you refuse to pay your subscription up to date. Uh, that is one of those things that you need to uh, also be sure of. Uh, we thank you uh, most sincerely. Is uh, uh, okay. In the aspect of that, will I have the pleasure of inviting uh, one of our uh, attendees, Otabo Rosemary? Are you there? If Otabo is, is there, please quickly uh, unmute yourself. Appreciate CITN for this to. We have done. Is Otabo there? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Otabo, are you there? I'm here. Good afternoon, sir. Okay. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. We are with you. We are with you. Continue. Okay, while we are waiting for Otabo, I can uh, open a day, Olu session. Please come on board to appreciate our people.
Okay. okay. My name is Albert Follanshop. <laughs> okay. okay. Yes, Pedabu. <laughs> Albert, you are muted, though. We can hear your phone call. Also, <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, who will do that for us? Okay, on I see there. Uh, is there for Shikling speaker? Who else can we yes, call? Sir. Okay, please talk to us. We love your very beautiful. Thank you very much. What is there? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. We are with you. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. We I can really, hear you. Just speak on. Okay, I really appreciate CIT and I appreciate every one of us. I appreciate our chairman. And I really want to say thank you. I really want to say thank you. I've really gained a lot. And I know other people and other colleagues too have really gained a lot through this webinar. Thank you very much. We we'll look forward to more of this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just before we go, we quickly want to hear from one of our past presidents, uh, past presidents, Gabriel Fashoto, please. We just noticed now that uh, you, you have joined, you have rejoined. So we, we want to hear from you as we close. Thank you, my past president, sir. Is he joining? Hmm? Just find it. Yeah, ask him to talk to him. Okay, uh, past president, please unmute yourself, sir. Past president, first of all. Okay, okay, is it? Is it? John did not. Okay, okay past president, first of all, please, we, we, we have you on board, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Just to commend the Fine president. Just to commend council uh, members of CITN for this laudable program. We look forward to educating the populace uh, as time goes on. And I have to commend the organizers, the moderator, and the paper presenters. Have a wonderful afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, my past president. It is on this note, we want to bring this uh, seminar to a close. And I can assure you that by the time you sleep tonight and wake up, you, you will also get some information from uh, uh, CITN as to other seminar we want to put to the community. Thank you so much. And we congratulate you to be that you are part of this program. Bye for now. Thank you very much. I do have long Please, I want to hear people sending questions. Sure. 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 S
Many thanks to all. Congratulations for CIK for value adding session. People are really congratulating us. We all put integrity and service We called on a side we shall attain
Oh, 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 oh,